focus on identifying the appropriate remote sensing data sources and technology that are of Uh, Aditya sir, hello. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you can start your lecture, sir. We have formal introduction about you. We just uh, have finished that part, and uh, we are just welcoming from here, and uh, we are extending that uh, a warm welcome uh, to this uh, August gathering because we have a lot of students here, so they are very eager to very eager to listen you and. Uh, just we will start for today's session. I am a rapporteur, and uh, our I think audio. Uh, I'm audible, sir. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, you can start, sir. Okay. Um, you can hear me just fine, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's good. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, this is really a pleasure, a, a big, big pleasure for me to be presenting at um, at, at this uh, workshop and conference. Uh, it just makes me really happy that something like this is happening. Uh, uh, I was obviously um, supposed to be there in person, but uh, some of the schedules didn't work out. So I'm sitting here on my dining table trying to do this from the middle of the night. Uh, it's still yesterday here, so. Um, what I'm about to sort of talk about is uh, the kinds of research that we're doing at the University of Florida, and specifically uh, our department, Ag and Biological Engineering, and then just a bit more specifically of the kinds of uh, research that I do. And so this is sort of like a, a three-tier presentation. And um, what I'm hoping is that, uh, one, you'll get a good idea of what's happening um, in our university, and, and two, which is largely what I would really like to get out of this is uh, basically strike up new collaborations. So we do work on a wide variety of research, but everything is incomplete if you're not doing solid international collaborations. I'm obviously Indian, so I have uh, a big soft spot for anything that we can do in India. So um, as I've reached out to a couple of people out, at, um, uh, out there, uh, please reach out to me at the end and, you know, the best thing, if you have any questions, just let us know. So um, jumping straight into this, uh, a big broad overview of the University of Florida. So we are a public uh, land grant research university. So when you say land grant, it's basically this um, act that was part, uh, passed in Congress in I believe 1862 or so in which the government gave federal lands to universities so that they could start research in agricultural engineering and other allied fields. So this is a big network of universities all over the US. And the, part, the biggest part of the land grant mission really means you do three things. Um, research, obviously, teaching, uh, very obviously again, and extension. So you actually take the science that you develop in the labs and you take it out to the stakeholders. So to the farmers, to the landowners, to the growers, and hopefully make it so that that research is translated into action on the ground. So that's the big philosophy behind land grant research universities. Um, we are located in Gainesville. It's in North Central Florida, so that tiny map uh, at, at the bottom right. So, you know, the US and Florida sticks out on uh, the Southeast corner and we are up in the Northeast corner in there. Uh, it's a small town, around 300,000 people, um, but it's a nice, University town, we have around 57,000 students. Uh, this happens to be the fifth largest single campus university in the US. We have around 16 colleges uh, and we offer more than 100 undergraduate majors, almost 200 graduate degrees. So 
different kinds of PhDs and master's degrees. Uh, we are also ranked almost uh, the fifth in all US public universities. Now, within uh, the University of Florida, we have IFAS, which is the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. So this is where the land grant, land grant part comes in really strongly. So this is the stuff that we do, uh, much like uh, your university. We have uh, research te teaching and extension activities. Uh, importantly, we have research and extension centers in every single one of the counties in Florida. So we have 67 counties, sort of like districts. Uh, we have an REC in every one of those districts. So we have scientists from IFAS, um, who uh, live and stay at those campuses and they conduct research and they take it straight to the stakeholders. Um, also, uh, we are also number one in federally financed higher education R&D expenditures. So we've had almost a billion, $100 billion in impacts just the last year. So this is a big, big system. Now, why, why do we do this for the most part? Um, it's largely the same issues everywhere, right? So you have, uh, issues of finding labor. Labor is uh, almost always in shortage. So you want newer techniques, uh, such as uh, applications of artificial intelligence, automation techniques, and robotics, stuff that can actually go in and one, um, solve some of those labor issues, and then also make it a lot more efficient. Um, so that is the big thrust. The other thing with Florida is that because it has this subtropical climate, we have literally every invasive species that lands in the US, almost all of them come through Florida. So we have a large concentration of invasives, both insect pests, uh, animals, uh, snakes. Uh, we have a big problem with uh, the large pythons, things like that, and just a bunch of trees. So you have lots of plants coming in, lots of uh, these uh, other organisms coming in that have a big negative impact on the economy and on the agricultural production and land management. So invasive species control is one of the biggest issues. Obviously, you want to compete better with other markets. You want to find better solutions that use less resources, so less fertilizer, less labor, uh, less oil burn, everything like that. So making agriculture a lot more efficient than what it is uh, currently. Uh, to put a holistic view around all of this, you also want people who are working in the fields to be a lot more healthy. Um, uh, to help them not get injured. Uh, this is again, you know, a hot place, well, hot is a relative term. Any place in India might be hotter than Florida, but we still have heat index uh, going up to uh, 100 degrees, would be 26 degrees uh, Celsius. And people have heat strokes all the time. So making it so that work in the fields is comfortable, it's profitable, and it's actually you know, environmentally sustainable. And then again, you know, creating new macro uh, flow paths, uh, reducing waste, the entire idea of the circular economy, you, know, you don't waste anything. And then largely to adapt and uh, be, uh, to be resilient to changes in the system, climate change being one of the biggest uh, issues out here. So, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in terms of AI, uh, we have just gotten into this uh, $70 million um, collaboration with NVIDIA. These are famously the people who make uh, graphical uh, processing units, GPUs for computers. Uh, the founder of NVIDIA happens to be you know, University of Florida alum. Um, so we now have the nation's, uh, the US's uh, fastest supercomputer in higher education. It's approximately third globally, I think. Uh, we are also hiring a lot of faculty, so almost a hundred. Uh, that will work directly or indirectly with AI. Uh, this is again, one of the largest uh, hiring uh, sort of efforts across the US. And uh, the, the applications of AI sort of span everything from research, teaching, workforce readiness, equity, inclusion, uh, all sorts of things. Specifically within IFAS or uh, the college that we are in, uh, Ag and Biological Engineering, Horticulture, Agronomy, we are looking at 10 core areas where we want to really develop. So it's um, precision breeding, uh, robotics, precision agriculture, Omics, or metabolomics, genomics, all sorts of uh, you know, phenomics, things like that. Food system resilience, uh, environmental systems, invasive shines, human health, AI methods and tools, hidden uh, collections, principles, education, communication. So the comprehensive ambit of everything. And the, we're getting in a very, very diverse and very talented set of faculty that touch upon each one of these uh, different um, 
areas of research. Uh, my own department, uh, Ag and Biological Engineering, uh, follows the exact same land grant mission. We do research teaching and extension. Uh, interestingly, we are associated with both the College of Engineering and the College of Agricultural and uh, Life Sciences. So this sort of makes sense. Usually engineering departments and uh, agriculture departments are sort of separate. We are one of those weird departments in which these two fields overlap pretty extensively. And uh, the big thing that we do is, uh, if you look at the kinds of research that's going on, it spans from people working at the nanoscale, so looking at um, waste removal in uh, wastewater, wastewater treatment, uh, looking at biochar immediated uh, uh, landfills, making uh, soil more fertile, things like that, so all the way to regional scale hydrology. So we have a wide variety of uh, faculty that do a, a millions of different things. And I'll basically touch upon that very briefly, I believe in the next slide. So we have 42 faculty members in the department, 17 with solid extension appointments. So I am one of those uh, people who have a 70% research and 30% extension appointment. And we have a wide variety of programs at AB and IFS in general, but we have two broad four sides. So one is automation of decision-making and another is the automation of physical activities. So this is in support systems and actual machinery. Now this is a small collection of the faculty that we have in our own department that work directly with automation, AI, and things like that. And as you can see, I come in at the last fourth. So I do remote sensing and spectroscopy. And I believe Vivek is going to speak tomorrow and he works on precision water management. So as, as you can see, we have people working from statistics and machine learning, agroclimatology, ecological modeling, uh, actual machinery, AI, machine business systems. The, the idea is that you have these diverse faculty that have their own narrow um, research areas, but they collaborate massively. So we all sit together and we discuss uh, larger projects. We collaborate on proposals. And then when, as, as and when we get funded, uh, we work together on these things. So no one has to really know everything. And that's, that's uh, believe me, that's really a, a very nice thing. So you can do your own small thing and basically just reach out to the other person sitting in the next office and, and basically have that cross-pollination of ideas going on. So it's a very vibrant, very, uh, very nice sort of a department, very nice place to work. So here are a couple of examples uh, from what our department has been working on. So this is, I believe, Giannis's work. Um, he has developed this, uh, uh, this wheat spraying robot, and it's uh, way cheaper than what's available in the market right now. So what uh, he's done is, is this array of cameras. Uh, this is this 3D model right at the bottom right. Um, so you have this tractor, uh, not really a tractor, a trailer that gets pulled by a tractor. You have an array of cameras that are looking at the ground, and they've gone and trained these machine learning, uh, learning algorithms to tell apart two things. One, if you already know what wheat it is, um, that one plant, and uh, also the broad functional types. So if it's a grass, if it's a broad leaf, if it's something else. And what that lets you do is you have another way of sprayers uh, that I believe are still in design to make them more precise. But there are uh, sprayers at the back and they have, they have different tanks of, um, of uh, weedicides. So what they're trying to do is not just blanket spray everything with weedicide because that's one, uh, an economic uh, waste and two, it's environmentally not responsible. So what this robot does is as it moves, it uses AI and machine vision techniques to identify these plants. And it basically just completely ignores uh, the useful plants or the plants that are non-target. And it only sprays uh, the weed that you've identified with the precise amount and uh, type of chemical that you need. So it's very nice system. It's still in development. Um, I don't know if it's going to go commercial, but um, we sure do hope it does. So this is one. Um, this is uh, Dr. Daniel Lee's work. Um, he has developed this uh, strawberry um, yield mapping system. So uh, as you can imagine, strawberries uh, flower and the number of flowers of the strawberries are directly proportional to the, to the number of fruit that are going to be produced unless something goes wrong, obviously. And if you have a good idea of how many plants are flowering, so the phenology of the flowering itself, uh, it's, uh, it's important because if you have too much uh, rainfall happening, this is flooded, it rains all the time. 
uh, you start getting into trouble with uh, fungal diseases. So the timing of the harvest has to be very closely um, coordinated with the application of fungicides and things because you don't want to contaminate the fruit. At the same time, you don't want to lose the entire crop. So this robot comes in handy. It travels slowly over the entire system. It detects uh, problems of the plants and it maps out what the potential yield is going to be. So this is another example of uh, actual robotics in the field. Uh, we also have other people. So this is not our department, but this is geomatics, which also we work very closely with. And this is again, strawberries. Uh, what they do, and Amar uh, specifically is a remote sensing scientist, much like me. And he is using machine vision techniques in um, taking multispectral images. So multispectral would be five band remote sensing. Um, and delineating individual canopies, identifying those plants, um, and then coming up with the metrics of plant health of, uh, of entire fields at a go. And, and most of this work that he does is using either uh, field-based robots or, or UAVs. So very exciting work out here as well. Um, then again, we are the citrus state, so we have just tons and tons of uh, citrus groves, mostly oranges that go for juicing. So these are not eating oranges, which mostly we get from California. And there's just a lot of work happening with, uh, with drones. I also do some of this work, uh, although I won't be touching on that in this presentation. Um, but uh, people have developed these systems in which you can uh, fly a drone, uh, automatically identify each one of those plants. So each one of those trees, so you can come up with maps of uh, places where you might have gaps in your orchards. And these are these orchards are massive. So you have I don't know, 10,000 trees in one. And so it lets the, the field manager know where are the gaps, uh, are the places in which gaps are forming consistently. And so there might be problems there so they can go scout that crop and you know do remediation measures such as pesticides and more fertilizer, whatever. We also have a big problem with this disease called uh, HLB or citrus greening. Uh, that's destroyed a large part of the citrus industry in, in Florida. So they are coming up with new techniques to one detect early um, if a plant, if, if a citrus tree has been infected by that bacterium and two um, measures of remediation. So they've come up with this really interesting system in which you have this big shroud that you put over an entire tree and you steam it. And that steam uh, kills off the bacterium. Uh, it does defoliate the, the tree but the tree recovers after a couple of months. And that's uh, a big boost to the growers uh, across the state. So these are all integrative sort of technologies that you know you can use them for one thing, but then uh, they have wider implications in the larger uh, larger picture of managing agriculture. Um, these are some industry examples, uh, and uh, I put them put them in there because we work uh, very closely with them. We help them uh, develop some of these automation techniques, and eventually. Scaling it up to a full-blown machine or uh, a commercial, you know, uh, system is not something that universities do anyway. So we pass on those technologies to these um, uh, these companies, and they they develop these um, markets around them. So this is Harvest Crew. Uh, they developed this uh, the strawberry picker. Strawberries are famously very soft, and they do not really uh, you cannot really keep them in uh, in markets for very long. Three days, and it's going to go bad. So it has to be picked when it's ripe and it has to be transported to the market really fast. And that becomes a big nightmare if you don't have the labor to do it. Labor is always in shortage uh, in the US. And so this is uh, one of those machines that's actually making a big dent. Uh, these are other harvesters. So they're looking at um, apples. This is another one that uses an articulating arm that picks the apple and twists to break it and then you know, takes it apart. And this is the, the strawberry harvesting machine. I do not seem to have a close up. Uh, if you look at the close up of how it's doing it inside that machine, it's, it's just fascinating. It's, it's, it's amazing how delicately it picks every one of those fruits and, and how it chooses to do that because you don't want to you know, pick um, strawberries that are not ripe. Oh, well, there are some of these uh, visuals, so yeah. So these are uh, examples of industry collaboration that we have. Um, uh, our grad students get picked off very soon. The moment they graduate, they get jobs either in industry or in other universities. So it's, uh, it's a very fruitful sort of collaboration. The bigger idea that we're looking at is basically of this. Um, 
this idea of smart farms, right? So, so far what we have are these individual technologies that target like one small thing. So there's uh, people doing either citrus groves and they're counting the trees. Other people are doing something else. Someone else is doing fertilizer recommendations, things like that. What we want to do is, uh, is, is develop this idea that all these data streams are actually part of a larger picture. So let's say you have survey drones that fly out there and you know they map out what's on the ground. They do baseline surveys. They can, um, like my work, I, I work on vegetation biochemistry. I'll talk about that just in, in just a uh, minute. But if you have those, uh, those images and those maps and that spatial data coming in, then you can actually say, um, send a fleet of what we are calling agribots or agricultural robots to go out there and say, if you have detected like pests, uh, spray those uh, plants with either pesticide or put more fertilizer or, or do something. Um, tractors in the US are already pretty smart. I mean, if you, um, if you look at the videos on YouTube or someplace, uh, you have fields that are thousands of acres and these, um, these tractors have DGPS units that will allow them to not leave a single stalk of corn um, in the entire field without overlapping anything. So that's already there, but you can now start using those GPS streams that come from the harvesters to sort of assess post hoc. Where are the places in the field where you're not getting enough yields? Um, what kinds of problems do you have? Do you have less, uh, you know, less soil carbon? Do you have like ditches in which you have anoxic conditions happening in the soil? Or it's basically just some places where the microbes just love to live. And that, that happens a lot, right? You have fields in which uh, certain corners are always just bad for whatever reason. So once you integrate all this data and you put it together with the uh, with climatology, with um, uh, for you know fertilizer recommendations, and you start thinking about this bigger idea, how do you take this data and actually make sense of it in a holistic manner? So that's one of the big things that we're working on: smart farms. Um, and this is obviously on a very industrial sort of a sense. The other thing we're also looking at is what's happening outside the U.S. Um, and uh, specifically in this part, we're looking at the human and ecological interface. So we people, we don't you know, exist in a vacuum. We interact with the natural environment in very complex manners. And this is, you know, at, as we all understand, you know, the, the link of uh, man and land is very tight. It has um, implications well beyond agriculture and production. It has cultural significances. It has, you know, uh, everything to do with how the entire socioeconomic system is set up. And we have a bunch of people who look at these things, uh, socio socio-ecological uh, dynamics, using again, big data and AI-based approaches. And I actually have another project much like this based out of India um, that I can discuss at, at some point, but that's again, not part of this presentation. So this is largely an overview of what's happening um, at, at UF, uh, at IFAS and uh, in our department. So, which basically brings uh, the question to what do I do here, right? We have 17, uh, we have 42 faculty. They all have their own specific research uh, ideas. I have a tiny bit of that. Um, uh, as, as far as my background is concerned, uh, I, I'm actually an architect. I used to be an architect back in the day, in 2000, MIT is all year. Um, I did a uh, postgraduate uh, diploma in planning from September. Uh, then I went to IRS uh, Dehradun to learn robot sensing and GIS. Those people taught me everything I know. Um, I came to the US in 2008, got my master's in wildlife ecology and conservation from the University of Florida here. Uh, then I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison to get my PhD in forestry. And I've been working here at AB since 2017 or so. Now, I've worked variously, you know, as an urban region planner, I've looked at uh, the forest and wildlife issues, uh, habitat suitability assessments. I also look at biodiversity uh, patterns across the Western Ghats. Um, you know, largely what I do is use remote sensing and GIS applications to understand how ecosystems function. But if you look at these degrees, you know, you wouldn't be wrong if you said, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but the kind of projects that I in my own lab, um, we have um, a big diversity of projects that sort of uh, speak to the kind of background that I have. You know, I do everything. So we have one from DOE that's looking at energy cane. Energy cane is this uh, variant of sugar cane that doesn't really produce that much sugar, 
but you can use the stubble for biology purposes. And it's also really efficient at picking out nutrients from the soils. So if we can use uh, replace sugarcane, because we're getting sugar from other places, if you can use energy cane to do bioremediation. So if you have severely nutrient-rich uh, soils that are basically leaking these nutrients into the water and you know causing trouble, Florida is all, all about the beaches. We start getting algal blooms. People do not like that. So we are trying to remedy that with energy gain. Um, we are working in Ghana, where we are building land planning tools for local authorities. Uh, we have a National Science Foundation cyber physical systems um, grant that looks at um, automating controlled environmental agriculture, so hydroponics, things like that. But in that particular project, we are taking wastewater, feeding it to the plants so that they can grow well, and you clean up the water and you grow crops out of it. So it's a closed loop sort of a system. Um, FTAX is the Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services. Uh, we are doing some trials with potatoes and looking at how we can use uh, sulfur recommendations uh, to mediate uh, NNP availability. We also have grants from the Ninth National Science Foundation that are looking at uh, big data AI applications in uh, forest ecology. So on that, we basically developed the methods that have mapped out, at this point, I believe, 200 million trees across the US. So we are using... Um, deep learning methods to identify individual tree canopies in natural forests. So you know, it's sort of easy if you have a grove or an orchard where you have nicely spaced trees, but if it's a forest, it's a nightmare. Um, so far, the model is working very well. Um, that uh, we were in India a couple of years back, looking at vegetation biochemistry across large forested regions in uh, Madhumalai, uh, Bandipur, and up in Navasa and um, uh, Shoyar in, in Gujarat. So that was, um, I'll talk about that just a bit. And then I'm also working in India on food insecurity issues. Um, this is basically looking at, can you actually take uh, socioeconomic data at core scales, downscale that to village clusters and actually assess how that relates to land cover change. So that's an ongoing project. It's wrapping up soon, but yeah. So the overarching principle of what I do is utilize remote sensing to understand ecosystem functioning. And that might be forested ecosystems, might be agriculture. Um, and then most of these things, you know, we think in terms of uh, existing models of software, most of these things don't exist. So we sit down, we develop our own instrumentation and uh, we also develop our own techniques. So statistical machine learning techniques to answer these basic and applied questions and how the composition structure and, and basically the biochemistry of ecosystems sort of influences the utilization and functioning of offset system. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So my work uh, sort of scales from individual plants and to entire landscapes. So if you look at, at you know, how high you're flying, so you're looking at 250 to 700 kilometers satellites. So satellite remote sensing, one of the most widely used uh, remote sensing techniques that, that's been out there for decades now. Um, we can do a bunch of different things, you know, disturbance, land use, land cover change, movable cycling, crop production. Um, if you get just a bit lower, so right at the top of the stratosphere or troposphere, um, you have imaging spectroscopy. So we have these uh, sensors that NASA flies with these big expensive um, instruments this is actually the same instrument that they've flown in India for the NASA ISRO project. Um, these are hyperspectral sensors. So you can do a lot more than what you can do with say, uh, IR satellites or Landsat or you know, Sentinel. Um, we have used these data to map folio biochemistry with them. And that's something that I'll go into detail because that's uh, the core part key, of what I do. Keywords, keywords. What we can also do is, uh, you know, uh, so these airplanes will fly from anywhere around 1,000 feet to 20,000 feet up in the sky. Um, if you want a closer look at what's happening on the ground at individual stands or plant scales, then you want UAVs. And so we do a lot of UAV research as well. Um, we're developing mobile and airborne remote sensing platforms. I'll show a couple of vignettes on that. And it's the same sort of applications that you can do with uh, airborne sensors that NASA provides, only that NASA has big expensive instruments and we don't, uh, but at the same time, you can develop the scaling relationships that will take that plant and actually let you assess what's happening at the landscape scales. The last is contact spectroscopy. So you basically just take a plant and you clamp on that instrument straight onto the leaf and you get a very pure measurement. 
so because the atmosphere is not sort of interfering with what's happening um, between the, the leaf and uh, the sensor, um, you can do for your biochemistry, you can do uh, morphological traits, um, largely everything that comes under the ambit of um, plant scale phenotyping. So that's the, the, the overarching idea of what I do in my lab. Um, so this is basically just an example of multispectral remote sensing Landsat, you know, very simple um, uh, generic applications such as looking at um, insect related uh, defoliation. This is up in the Green Bridge and Savage River State Forest in Maryland, that's northeastern US. Um, what you see in the maps here is basically uh, these insects that have gone in uh, gypsy moths. They've gone and defoliated large stands of trees. Now, th these are what we call easy applications because you know if um, an entire tree is dead, it's easy to tell. And because these um, eruptions are pretty large, you can actually see them with satellites. So this is good. This is a multispectral remote sensing. The second uh, kind of remote sensing that I work a lot with is hypertemporal remote sensing. So now you have sensors that pass the Earth every two days, uh, more or less years, uh, things like that. Now. The, the good thing with these satellites is because you, you have such a high rate of coverage in the temporal domain, you can actually look at landscape dynamics. So we use these data to assess um, uh, nitrate and yields from forested watersheds in the Chesapeake Bay. This is again up in the Northeast. Um, and and you, you can see that using uh, this uh, fancy sort of model called a functional linear uh, concurrent model, we were able to track uh, nutrient yields from these watersheds at at pretty high uh, accuracies. So if you look at the, the green dots on subplot C, that's what we had observed and the red plots are what we're predicting with, the, with our algorithm. So it's around like 79% accurate at the month on month scales, so around 94, 93% uh, accurate at um, intra-annual variations. And because this is remote yeah. sensing, the best thing is you can actually, you know, apply these models on a pixel-wise basis and actually see how that landscape changes. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, that's uh, hypertemporal remote sensing. But what I do uh, at the core of my research is hyperspectral remote sensing. So, I mean, if you look at this sort of cartoon representation of the solar spectrum, um, this is how the, the black line is where uh, the amount of radiation that reaches the surface of the Earth. Right? And then you have those big gaps where you have absorption happening due to water vapor or carbon dioxide, things like that. And if you see those, those green and red regions, these are the spectral uh, sampling intervals for major satellites. So the green one is Landsat, the red one is MODIS. And MODIS, because it's you know, much bigger pixels, it can actually afford to sample a really narrow part of that spectrum. So these are the generic remote sensing um, sensors. Now, if you go to hyperspectral sensors, this is what you see. So you've taken that spectrum and you've chopped it up into hundreds of very narrow wave bands. So the question always is, why do you want to do this? Because this is a very expensive, very delicate instrument. Why do you need all that information where you've had seven bands and you were doing just fine? So the idea is that if you look at a vegetation spectrum, the shape of that spectrum tells you a lot about what's happening in, in, in the biochemistry of that leaf. And as we all know, all biology at the base is basically just chemistry, right? So if you know what the chemistry of the leaf is, you can tell a bunch of things about it. Um, the, simple, uh, the simplest application could be, if you know how much nitrogen there is in the leaf, then you know if you need to fertilize it or not. Um, if there are certain defense chemistries such as cardinaloids being um, expressed, then you know that uh, there's some insect that's you know, bothering that plant and encouraging that plant to uh, sort of express those chemicals that will fight off um, those, uh, uh, those, those particular pathogens or pests. So if you can get the biochemical profiles from the spectra, and if you can apply these spectra across large regions, you are done. I mean, you can understand how the ecosystem functions biochemically. So now you're not just talking about whether or not this is corn or soybeans. You're saying you have corn with 3% nitrogen, the other one has 4.3. So you need to take care of that first one uh, for an example. And so this sort of goes back to some research that I did for my PhD actually. So this is eight years back, eight, nine years back. Um, we, uh, for, for any of these, you know, 
building these models, what you have to do is collect just tons and tons of data. So we went to all the forested ecosystems and we uh, collected leaves from the top of the canopies after NASA had flown the sensor and we collected a bunch of these data. Um, so you had spectra coming from individual images and then you had uh, four year samples that collected in the field. You collect them, you take the spectra, and then you send it off for chemical analysis to the lab. They come back with a chemical profile and then you, know, you can do your research. So using those data, these are the results that we'd gotten. So this is basically building models of foliar biochemistry at the canopy scale uh, for seven uh, broad functional traits. So you have put some nitrogen in the leaf, uh, LMA, uh, leaf mass per area. This is an indicator of leaf mass uh, per area. So leaf thickness, largely. Uh, you have uh, areal, which is lignin, cellulose and fiber. So all three in combination uh, will determine how nutrients are cyclic, cycled at the forest floor. You have a uh, person carbon, which is obvious. And then you have uh, delta N15, which is uh, the heavy isotope of nitrogen, which is a very good indicator of nitrogen availability. So again, remember, if you can build a model using the spectra, you can apply that model back to the spectra and you can create maps. So way back when, when we just had uh, NLCD or the National Land Cover Database, this is a program in the US that takes Landsat data and makes land cover maps on an annual basis for the entire US. Um, all you had was, you know, you would just know that this is a deciduous forest or an evergreen forest or something else. Using these techniques, we can actually make maps of biochemistry. So if you look at LMA or nitrogen percent, you can see that something that is basically just deciduous forest now has a detail that you can, you can say that this is high nitrogen, this is moderate nitrogen. And that then speaks to, in reverse, what the species might be. So um, high nitrogen species are usually the thin uh, leaf species such as maples, um, moderate would be somewhere oaks. Um, and then, you know, if you start getting the conifers that are low nitrogen species that are a lot more nutrient retentive and, and things like that. So it's almost uh, the, the, the biochemical profile of a landscape speaks to two things. One is the species composition and two is its functioning. So depending on where you have what, will eventually determine how the entire ecosystem functions. And this is an example, just a zoomed in uh, picture of what, what we've been able to do. And this is using Avaris. Avaris is one of uh, NASA sensors that they fly at 20,000 feet, so 20 meter pixels. Oh, sorry, 60,000 feet. <clears throat> Since then, we've gone uh, with, with the success on, on that one particular Thank research. We, went and extended the traits to from seven to 26. So not only do you have these broad functional traits, uh, these now include other functional types such as grasses and, and some crops and forbs and also the trees and also agriculture. So if you look at um, these profiles, now you have carotenoids, chlorophyll, boron, calcium, carbon, cellulose, copper, uh, delta C13, which is the heavy isotope of carbon. That's a pretty good indicator of uh, drought stress. Delta M15, nitrogen availability again, um, the equivalent water thickness, which is a good indicator of water status in a plant. Um, fiber, flavonoids are good indicators of um, defense chemistries um, for fighting off pathogens and pests. Then you have mass-based carotenoids, chlorophylls, nitrogen, non-structural carbohydrates, manganese, magnesium. So the full panel of macro and micronutrients. So now you don't even need to understand what that species is. If you already know this information about that one plant or one field, you can actually start implementing your man management interventions. And you can say, okay, so this particular one needs this, this other one needs something else. Um, these are published research. I mean, uh, these papers are out. If anyone needs any of these papers, you can obviously just write to me and I can send them to you. Um, this is still ongoing research. So we have built these calibrations, but they're always a work in progress, like pretty much all research. Uh, this is a really quick uh, demonstration of what you can do once you have these maps. And this is, again, an ecology-based demonstration. We don't do uh, more stuff like that, unfortunately, in agriculture. But, you know, this is a structural equation model that, that you know, builds a story. And you say, okay, um, the factor X affects factor Y, but then factor Z also affects factor Y, but then factor Y in turn affects something else. And, you know, usually we are used to these linear models in which you say, this is an outcome. 
And there are these three predictors and we better generalize linear model to see which ones are significant and which works perfectly for hypo hypothesis uh, based research. But if you have a system that is just a bit more complex than that, in which several factors are you know, affecting several different things, structural equation models actually come in pretty handy. So we did this research up in uh, the upper Midwest, which is Wisconsin. And we said, well, we have maps of folio bike industry. Can we understand how um, forest ecosystems cycle nutrients differently from agricultural ecosystems? So we proposed this model, we put in the data and then we fit it. And um, if you look at the size of the arrows, they basically say, this is the strength of this relationship and the color sort of talks to uh, whether it's a positive or a negative interaction. And um, I can send you the paper on this one also, but most of our hypotheses were sort of, you know, uh, supported in that foliar retention actually uh, resulted in a lot of nutrient retention in wetlands. And a lot of wetlands actually had uh, a negative effect on runoff. And then you know, that then positively affects water quality downstream. So what this comes down to is basically this. So if you have a landscape that you can actually paint with the biochemistry of that one, um, one particular ecosystem, you can start seeing these patterns emerge that can pinpoint where the, where the interventions can be applied. And also what kind of interventions? So if you have combinations of things happening in certain places, so let's say you have um, you know, a depression someplace which is collecting water and if it's uh, creating anoxic conditions or encouraging a fungal growth, these kinds of techniques will pinpoint that um, the kinds of response that we need from plants, which is higher yield eventually, um, if these complex systems interact in certain manners that are not obvious to the casual observer, you can fit these models and basically pinpoint areas that need uh, different kinds of interventions. And you know that then speaks to integrated pest management. It speaks to uh, nutrient management, all sorts of new things. So very powerful tool, hyperspectral mode sensing. This is just an example of you know comparing uh, how differently forest and agricultural uh, ecosystems uh, uh, sort of behave uh, across large landscapes. And all of you know this stuff better than I do probably. Um, so that is uh, just a vignette of spatial uh, applications of spectroscopy. These are four discrete examples of what other things you can do. So top left, um, milkweed is this plant that, you know, when you, certain plants, when you break the leaf, you have that milk oozing out of that. Um, so this is this plant that is the whole species for monarch butterflies. It's an iconic butterfly across the U.S. They actually have them in, in India as well. These butterflies are declining for whatever reason, and people were trying to figure out what's happening. Um, but what we were trying to do is, can you use spectroscopy to see if the defense chemistries, which is that milk that is produced, can you track that in a non-invasive manner? So um, if you have a plant that's not been disturbed and another plant that you go and either put a cat caterpillar on it or damage it somehow, can you actually see the defense chemistries coming up in the leaves and making it more resistant to further attack? And as you can see from this graph, that actually worked. So this was a beautiful example of how you can use spectroscopy to do um, um, assess what's happening inside a plant without any obvious uh, changes to the leaves. Um, the top right one is looking at delta 13 C. So this is the heavy isotope of carbon. Uh, we basically oh, built a model using down, completely down, different data. And then we applied that yes, to um, <laughs> A bunch of uh, plants that we predicted from the field, and when we predicted how much uh, heavy isotope, uh, isotopic carbon there was, uh, the ones that had been grown in the field and were drought stressed came out right at the top. So those red dots. Um, uh, the crop physiologist in this group will uh, will know this probably better than I do. Um, you know, when you have drought stress, uh, the stomates close, and the plant is forced to use all the carbon that it has. And that basically ends up elevating the, the isotopic signatures in the leaves. And uh, spectroscopy lets us see that. So imagine if you can make a map of delta C13 concentrations in crop uh, in, in fields, you will be able to tell that there are certain places uh, where there probably isn't enough moisture. So you know you could have either soil remediations or have additional um, irrigation facilities, um, you know, pinpointing those locations. Um, these other two are uh, sort of cartoonish. Uh, example. So this was what uh, with tobacco plants, we injected the plant with a uh, cell killing bacterium. 
and we waited 15 minutes to see what would happen uh, with the spectroscopy. So the plant is still not dead. It's going to take, I guess, a day to die. But within 15 minutes, you could actually see that the plant internally had been reacting very differently, even though you could not visually tell any symptoms. And the other one is also very interesting. It's potato virus. Why um, they grow a lot of potatoes in the US. But everyone likes potatoes, right? So uh, you have this potato virus. Why that affects uh, potatoes a lot. And uh, this, by the time you figure out that a plant is sick, uh, you've already lost the crop. So what we were trying to do was uh, we went out there and inoculated a bunch of these plants with a virus. And we just looked at the canopy. Uh, so because you've just inoculated that like uh, five days back, um, the plant's not going to show any symptoms. But if you look at the spectra, the biochemistry has changed enough that you can actually tell that some of these are infected and some of these are not, even though the plants look exactly the same. So spectroscopy has this, um, this, this power of pulling apart biochemical profiles and leveraging them to answer basic and applied questions in plant sciences. It's just amazing. I mean, I love my job. Um, what are we doing right now? Um, we have built a system. It's called the Scanning Plant IoT Facility uh, Spot. So this is actually a bad picture, but if you look at this um, aluminum frame, this, this big thing, it's a big box that's eight feet by eight feet by eight feet. And we have a hyperspectral scanner. Uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer right here, but this, uh, the, the big tangle of wires. Um, that's hyperspectral scanner that's loaded onto these, these motors and the motors let it scan through uh, the space. So we take um, plants, we put it inside that space and we scan them with a hyperspectral scanner and we develop the biochemical profiles of um, what the scanner sees. And this particular example, uh, so this person standing in the foreground is Cosimo. He came in from the University of Pisa, Italy to do research on tomatoes. The Italians love the tomatoes, uh, all of us do, right? And they have a big problem with salinity ingress in the coastal regions where they grow most of these things. And um, they, uh, he wanted to learn how they can use spectroscopy to one, assess which plants are affected, two, select the cultivars that will not be affected that much, and three, if you can actually have you know, ongoing remediation measures that will save these plants if, the, if, if it's possible at all. And so we basically just finished this uh, experiment, I believe, a couple of weeks back. So he's still analyzing the data. Uh, but the person standing in back, he's my PhD student, Stephen. Um, he works on uh, lettuce. And he has another fellowship from NASA that's uh, basically focused on can you grow plants in space? Uh, literally that. So can you develop a system that is completely enclosed that will draw a plant um, in a digital twin sort of a framework? And so he's developing the ecophysiological models that sort of predict plant growth, also test the water quality use, using um, an ultraviolet absorption spectrometer that we've designed in our lab ourselves. And uh, basically model the entire system as it you know, goes from seedling to maturity to harvest. So these are the big questions we're asking. How do plants respond to stress? How do different genotypes respond to stimuli such as um, all sorts of things? So we have uh, fungi, we have bacterial pathogens, and we even put insects on the plants to see what they'll do. Um, and uh, basic questions are, can we build mathematical models or AI-based models to predict the responses of the plants to all these different pressures that we're putting on them? And uh, most importantly, what are the sensors or systems needed to answer these questions? So half the time, you know, most of these, this instrumentation just doesn't exist. So you have to actually sit down and build it. Um, and uh, that's, that's a great thing about being in this department because we have people who only work on sensor development, only work on algorithm development, stuff like that. So I can basically just go up there and say, I'm an imaging spectrum, spectroscopy person, I need this. And there will be someone who knows how to do this. So again, I'll, you know, the, the collaboration is the biggest part. Uh, this is just a simple example of what we've done with lettuce. These are two cultivars. Uh, this light green cultivar and dark green cultivar. I mean, it's pretty obvious when you look at the RGB or a simple uh, picture, right? When you start applying these models to them, uh, this is nitrogen. So it doesn't really look like there is a strong pattern to it. So nitrogen wise, they're all pretty much similar. Um, if you look at uh, leaf mass per area, so the leaf thickness, they also look roughly the same. But the moment you look at other things, uh, so this is uh, fiber percent, uh, they're very different in fiber content of the leaf and also very different in the lignin content. And obviously lignin and fiber are pretty highly correlated. Now this then talks to 
uh, another angle, which is the nutritional quality of the food that we eat. So there's fertilizing requirements, which is what's good for the plant. But at the same time, you're going to eat these plants, right, eventually. So uh, at least in the US, there's this big movement of people wanting more nutritious food. So they want more antioxidants, they, more, they want it to be more crunchier, more tastier, things like that. Stuff that is not easily um, assessed using you know, standard techniques. And that's what we're trying to do. So um, if you can come up with uh, a rapid phenotyping platform like this, then you can rapidly uh, breed these plants to have the exact traits that you need. So lignin, anthocyanins, so the, the anthocyanins are antioxidants that a lot of people are going after. Carotenoids, you know, vitamin A, cancer protective, uh, sorts of um, properties. Uh, chlorophyll, obviously, you know. So chlorophyll is very different than these two cultivars. So this is all nice and fun. You're doing all this in the lab. Um, how do you scale this up to an actual field? So we've developed this drone. Um, uh, we call it Cyclops. Um, it's uh, the same instrument uh setup so we have a hyperspectral image i don't know if you can see this box and this tube sort of sticking out that's the lens of the camera the big cylinder on top that looks greenish uh, that's a lidar scanner um, and then that black thing sticking out from the bottom that's a thermal scanner so what we're trying to do is the lidar scanner you know shoots lasers out in the, the landscape and uh, calculates the time of flight distance coming back to it so you get this point cloud that you can then leverage to find the structural complexity of the canopy. So how high is the plant, how much biomass there is, and then that you know, goes into how much carbon content in the ecosystem, things like that. LIDAR is its own field completely. Uh, but we need the LIDAR to orthorectify our uh, hyperspectral imagery. And so that is that. So this is a tight, tightly integrated system with a hyperspectral GPS that gets us within, I believe, a centimeter of where we need to be. And uh, the biggest problems that we had so far was, you have lots of drones out there, but none of them will fly more than 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And if you want to do 50 acres of fields, you just cannot. Uh, so if you're trying to do a big trial with 120 varieties of something, and if you can only fly 15 minutes and then land, and then you change the batteries or fly again, by the time the, the you have finished scanning the field, um, the solar conditions have changed, and now the images are not comparable. So we sat down and we had someone build this for us. This one has a gas electric engine. So <coughs> it's a tiny two stroke engine that has a generator attached to it. So it basically uh, generates, I believe 2,400 watts. So 24 kilowatts, 2.4 kilowatts. And it can carry, so our sensor package itself has around 15 pounds or so, seven kilos. So this can lift the entire thing and fly for almost an hour, I believe. We've, uh, we just flew it for 68 acres and it flew beautifully. So um, this is uh, the, the new work cost that's sort of helping us fill the gaps between what we're doing inside the lab at Spot with the leaf level spectrometers and, um, and between that and what NASA can fly at a thousand feet. So, you know, this is the gap filling instrument for us. Um, yeah, this is basically just, uh, I just told you about this stuff. Um, these are the sensors and you know the payloads on on Cyclops, and what we're also doing is uh, so Cyclops itself. You know, once you put all the instrumentation and everything together, it becomes uh, hundred and thirty thousand dollar instruments. It's very very expensive, and you know it's that basically just puts it out of reach of anyone. So not even farmers in the U.S. who make a lot of money are going to invest in something like this. So it can only be a service that a university can provide, um, and that's what we do. So we've build the system using federal and um, university funds. And what we're trying to do is develop a user mapping service or invasive species detection service, things like that. And uh, that's half the field work in my lab, especially flying this one drone. What we're also doing is um, we are training uh, undergrads. So, you know, bachelor students to build these drones themselves. Uh, recently, what happened was uh, the US government sort of decided that uh, certain drone makers were not doing the right thing in terms of security measures and all that. So they banned an entire class of drones. A lot of people own these drones. And so that sort of put a big hole in uh, research activities, especially with you know, multi-spectral cameras and things like that. So we said, okay, fine. We'll just design our own and we'll build it. And then uh, whosoever wants it can basically just download the, the schematics and build it. And so this is what's happening. Um, we have a group of around 60, students that have signed up for this UAS club that we call it UAV club. And um, we have at least 15 to 20 active members. 
and they, they they're just amazing students so they they've divided up this entire work among themselves one person is doing the 3d modeling the other person is doing sensors the third person is doing algorithms and it's just a very nice big collaborative collegiate sort of a, um, uh, of an effort and i believe we will be able to build a drone at a fraction of the cost that is available commercially and then i'm hoping that we'll be able to publish these designs so that anyone can download them and you know we'll basically just um uh, uh, train other people to do it and i believe uh, we we have two uh, scientists coming in from uh, vnmkv uh, to the university of florida this summer and they will work on this uh, drone i believe it's going to get done by the time they're here and we'll train them to use fully open source tools to um, build and fly these things and that's just you know that that's just the opening so what we really want to do is host as many people as we can uh, you know possibly and also build new collaborations with uh, with people working in india uh, there's just a big big population of um, indian scientists out, out in the us who would love to get back there and you know help out in, in any way we can so please feel free to contact me uh, the email is right there or you can talk to kalashji he can give you uh, my uh, contacts and uh, yeah if you have any questions this was obviously a very very rushed presentation but i could only cram in so much in here so thank you again for having me and letting me speak to you on on these things this has uh, been a lovely experience and i again regret that i couldn't be able to be there physically but thank you again uh, thank you dr aditi ji very nice space for all of us in the morning session i hope a uh, few questions will come i am giving the mic to the students so, so they will have a questions just one minute sir um we getting some feedback so could you type the question out in the chat might be just a bit easier uh, sir one question comes to how map of polar bio biochemistry uh, and water quality maps of sir how maps of polar biochemistry helpful for water quality analysis yeah that's an excellent question we actually have project funded just on that so uh, let's let's take this as an example so if you are growing a crop and uh, let's say the amount of nitrogen it needs is you know say 100 pounds an acre now you given a 200 pounds an acre what's going to happen is um, the plant can only use a certain amount of nitrogen right so it it depends on what the biomass of the plant is what the genotype and cultivar is and all those things if you start tracking the biochemistry of the leaf using imaging spectroscopy or you know some some technique you can make a map of what that uh, what the amount looks like now if you can scale it up to the biomass you can uh, assess how much of that nitrogen is picked up and has been incorporated into the plant whatever is left is either sitting in the in the soil profile and it's basically either going to get you know used up by the microbes or microbial action uh, if if any or if you have a big precipitation event it's going to get leached up so if you track that uh, through time and most of these things have to be done you know uh, through time because uh, unless you're doing uh, trials in which you're putting in different amounts in different places so if you can track the biochemistry through the time you can start looking at what the plant is doing in terms of um, nitrogen utilization and then you know eventually looking at uh, end use efficiency or you know 
uh, water use efficiency and things like that. Now, this particular experiment that we're trying to do is trying to address the exact same question. Um, we have this weird uh, system of uh, irrigation in Florida that's called tile drainage. So uh, Vivek will hopefully talk about that about this tomorrow, um, but I'm not entirely sure. So the Florida uh, water table is super high. So you know, if you dig a ditch like six feet deep, you'll start getting water because you know this is just super sandy soils. Um, it's it's not you know we don't have any mountains to speak of. It's very flat, and uh, we get a lot of rain because we have uh, oceans on three sides of, of the peninsula, right? Now this water goes up and then what, what they do is they have these uh, tiles that they cut out and they basically let the drain, uh, let the water sort of um, flow by, you know, collect in a canal and then you know they, they throw it out. So if you're adding too much fertilizer uh, or you know if you take all the fertilizer and put it up, you know at, at the same time, the plant can only pick up so much and the rest will get leached out. So we are putting these sensors outside where the where these these tiles drain out, and we are seeing how much of that was uh, put in the in the field, how much change in the foliage, and how much is basically just coming out uh, in the ditch. And that will let us do uh, a crude, you know, nitrogen budget of what you had applied, what got used up, and what got leached out. So that's, that's a really simple sort of a way to look at this. Eventually what we want to do is develop these uh, crop eco ecophysiological models. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with DSAC. Um, Gerrit Hugumbo in our department actually is the person who runs the AGMIP, the agricultural model in the comparison project, I believe. Um, so he is the person who curates uh, DSAC and they, you know, uh, DSAC is obviously a very complex uh, ecophysiological model, but if you can incorporate these uh, factors into it, or build new modules, you can start modeling what's happening in a plant. Um, I don't know if that answers the question uh, properly, but yeah, this is an active field of science. So that's an excellent question. You can do a PhD on that. Sir, one more question and we will uh, just... I think there are no many questions, sir, from students, but we are happy. We learned so many things from your presentation today. And uh, before closing uh, your presentation, may I request our PI, Dr. Go. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Aditya, for being with us. And uh, it's a very short. Uh, a period of uh, connection and uh, we have grabbed uh, with so many uh, kinds of activities. We are very, really inspired with your uh, valuable uh, speech. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So from this campus, we, we and MKV campus as we have started this project from 2019 onwards, we are about to establish the drone uh, design and development laboratories, robotic uh, components, design and development laboratories. We are using, in, in fact, 3D printer. And uh, we are happy to say that the CAD CAM applications by uh, the agricultural sciences, engineering and technology students, they are doing very nice kind of uh, modeling, meshing, simulation. They are also making the validation of the such components which are uh, manufactured by the 3D printer. And it's a privilege to have uh, this kind of activity similarly going on in Florida. And uh, we are all team members from uh, uh, the uh, VNMKV campus, professor faculty from different departments, entomology, agronomy, soil science, mechanical engineering, irrigation engineering, agriculture engineering, farm machinery, all those are involved with their participation in developing different kinds of precision uh, machineries. We are in fact also very much uh, uh, influenced for the, the small and marginal farmers who are in demand of a small portable machinery. Uh, that was smart sensors applications. By use of such a technology, they will be helpful by, for their field operations. And definitely it goes to uh, impact the overall productivity, which used to be enhanced. And uh, 
for this we are uh, uh, we are joining our pg phd student to enter into uh, the florida campus whatever the research activities that are going on and uh, they will be having their own topics titles of research and their participatory all objectives related to this uh, applications that you have just now mentioned it out so definitely we will be uh, having a uh, we will be having a very good collaboration in this regard and our team professor team research students will join and we'll be very much happy to enjoy with uh, your florida team and pick up. in fact i must invite you at this juncture to please have a visit, uh, offline visit to our campus with your team members and uh, also we will be uh, visiting uh, florida soon thank you thank you dr aditya and we will be continuing this communication hereafter thank you thank you so much yes and and i forgot to do this uh, um, please excuse me dog um this uh, the shameless plug for the department you know we get just excellent students from india all the time so you know, i would hate to you know steal the smart students from there, but we are always you know looking for good smart students. oh my god please excuse me dog please it's, it's it's middle of the night so um yeah and i i look forward to Thank you. Uh, making this collaborations uh, wider and broader and uh, yes i'm looking forward to having you here and i'm actually going to be in india in june so do come down and visit you guys in the campus very much sir uh, i'll yeah. stop sharing yeah 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 thank you very much sir okay good night sir take care good night sir good night sir i'll stick around for just a bit moment and then i'll leave thank you sure. sir madam dr manoj karke sir Hello. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everybody. Um, sir. Hi, sir. How are you? Hear me? So it is a late okay. night for you. <laughs> uh, not as late as Dr. Singh's. Yes, yes. Time is different than Florida and Pullman. Florida is like past midnight, past one o'clock actually. That's really bad. Uh, ours is ten thirty right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, Dr. Manoj. Uh, I'm Dr. Gopal Singh here to hear you and. Very good morning. Very good evening to you. We will be uh, joining after uh, this completion of the sessions for discussion. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. Just give me one minute. Uh, here virtual uh, introduction for your sir. Our one of the speaker. She will introduce the audience. So just we start. And uh, we will allow you as a co-host. So you can uh, give your presentation from the research. Just two minutes, Adam. Barely. I can bear. I can barely hear you. Pradeep Singh for your nice lecture. Now I welcome our next speaker, Dr. Manoj Karki sir, uh, and our I welcome him on behalf of the organizing committee and uh, the rapporteur for this session, we, uh, Dr. S N Pawar sir. I welcome the rapporteur also, Dr. Manoj Karki for starting his uh, speech. We will uh, have just a brief introduction of Dr. Manoj Karki sir. Dr. Karki is working as Associate Professor uh, of uh, Biological Systems Engineering Department, Center for Precision and Automated Agricultural Systems, Washington State University. He has completed his PhD in Agricultural Engineering and Human Computer Interaction at Iowa State University. He has completed his master's degree in remote sensing and GIS from Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. He has joined the Washington State University in 2010, where he lives 
strong research programs in agricultural automation and mechanization area with a particular emphasis emphasis on machine regions and sensing technologies for agricultural automation and robotics he has been working on many sponsored projects in this area including crop load estimation draw some cleaning crop stress monitoring smart irrigation systems for wine grapes he has published his work in many reputed journals and also acted as an editor in uh, many reputed journals like this applied engineering in agriculture and robotics He is interested in automated and autonomous agricultural machinery systems, field robotics, machine intelligence for agricultural production. He has got first prize in multidisciplinary grant competition for STAR to exemplify the research excellence. He has been also awarded with many awards, including the Research Excellence Award from Iowa State University. And today, uh, Dr. Manoj Karki sir is going to deliver us the lecture on the topic "Future of AI and Robotics in Specialty Crops." I will once again welcome Dr. Karki sir. Thank Mary you very much, Dr. Karki sir, to start your lecture. Thank you really very much, and thank you, Dr. Sinde, and everybody in the organizing team. Thank you for invitation and the opportunity to share some of the uh, research work that we're that we're doing in agricultural automation and robotics, and also a few thoughts around where we might be going in the future in this area. So, with that, I'll uh, share my screen here, and we'll go from there. So you can share your presentation. Give me one quick second. Yes, visible, sir. So um, again, we'll be talking mostly about automation and robotics in agriculture, uh, even more particularly uh, for specialty crops that includes fruit and vegetable, and some of the other other crops such as nuts and nuts nursery crops, um, particularly because that's the area where automation and robotics is lacking to some extent compared to the field crops such as corn and soybean. Um, but before anything else, I'd like to begin with these two uh, pictures here uh, and give the audience uh, maybe 10 seconds to just go, go through them quickly and just spend a couple of seconds on them. So with that, um, again, my name is Manus Karki, Associate Professor here at the, at the Biological Systems Engineering Department, Center for Precision and Automated Agricultural Systems. Um, the, um, the lecture covers both, uh, again, some of the research examples from my program, as well as some thoughts around uh, future of automation and robotics in agriculture as stated in the introduction earlier. Before I get into why I do what I do in automation and robotics, I'd like to kind of lay out a quick kind of uh, observation around how AI, cyber physical system and agriculture interact and how the recent advancement in automation and robotics and artificial intelligence would be helpful in achieving what we'd like to achieve in agriculture, which is in my opinion, um, producing as much uh, and as good quality producers with as little input as possible. And when I say input, it includes labor as, as it is one of the really critical inputs in farming, particularly in the specialty crops such as fruit and vegetable where a lot of field operations are still manual and um, labor intensive. So on our left, we see uh, here AI, artificial intelligence, uh, some of the tools and algorithms or techniques involved uh, within uh, AI include machine learning. Uh, one of the specific areas of machine learning these days is deep, deep learning. Uh, a lot of us uh, in this area are using deep learning uh, as a tool or algorithm or model to perform various tasks in agriculture, such as analyzing different kinds of images for various purposes. 
expert, expert systems and heuristics where we'd like to use the knowledge of uh, experienced farmers, horticulturists, crop scientists, in other words, some of the domain experts as well as uh, expert farmers in developing new solutions and, and developing um, decision support and other kinds of modeling systems that would have be helpful for farming. And predictive modeling is another tool, again, available within the scope of AI. These fundamental algorithms and models would help us develop or would lead to uh, other technologies that are really applicable in doing better job in farming that include pattern recognition, machine vision, big data analytics, decision support systems, as well as robotics. And when we have these uh, fundamental technologies or foundational technologies available, we could do a really good job in understanding and uh, perceiving and understanding plant condition and environment. Uh, when I say plant, I think it, it could be extended to any other agricultural environment, such as animal farming or aquatic farming and such. Uh, making farming decisions and using these kinds of technologies would be more um, robust and reliable and accurate in making various farming decisions, such as when to apply water or when to apply nitrogen, as we also heard from um, uh, Dr. Singh's presentation uh, just um, before this one. Um, there are a lot of um, reflectances and a lot of other parameters that we can, we can sense from these uh, plants and soil and other environmental um, parameters that we could sense through hyperspectral camera, multispectral camera, color camera, as well as 3D and other sensors and that would help us again make uh, reliable farming decisions. And then implement those decisions such as uh, if we know a um, certain amount of water is needed at a certain time in a certain part of the field, we might just um, develop and implement a uh, automated control system to open and close valves, uh, applying right amount of water at right time at right location. We might be developing um, automated or precision chemical application system to achieve again, kind of similar goal there, uh, applying right amount, right type of chemical at right time at right location at right um, doses. It could also be robotic system picking fruit when, when the fruit is ready for picking um, or pruning trees when it is necessary and things like that. And in, in addition to that, I think it is also possible with these technologies to analyze the outcome of our farming uh, decisions and in its implementation. Uh, for example, if we applied certain amount of water at certain time at certain location, is it leading to the type of outcome that we would like to achieve um, in terms of yield and quality of uh, agricultural products. And that's the kind of the analysis of outcome that is possible with th these kinds of technologies. Where it helps, uh, pretty much everything we do in, in farming could benefit from these kinds of uh, foundational technologies and the capability to do various things that I mentioned in the um, a moment ago, including perceiving plant and making farming decisions. We could be, as I mentioned earlier, uh, doing better job in water and nutrient management. Uh, we could be doing uh, much better job in pest management, canopy management, harvest and post-harvest operations and, and such. So with that, again, it will help us achieve the ideal precision goal, uh, precision act goal, as I mentioned earlier, understand and manage individual plant level variability. Each plant is different. It has its own unique uh, needs in terms of uh, inputs, including labor, when I say input, and, and I think with these kinds of uh, interactions between cyber physical system and, and AI, yeah. uh, we'll be able to achieve those goals. Now, I, I think I didn't uh, talk a lot about uh, cyber physical system in this case, but uh, in, in general, uh, this will be the tool that would allow us to link all the uh, cropping or animal systems, uh, all the, the sensors, all software tools, uh, human or, or farmers and other experts involved in farming, all kinds of machinery uh, through cloud computing and other platforms so that they're talking to each other. There is an integrated system uh, for perceiving the environment, making farming decisions and implementing those decisions. And that's the tool available through cyber physical system in addition to artificial intelligence that, that we discussed. 
Now that's behind. I would like to start uh, with a quick uh, background on, on our um, advancement and um, uh, accomplishment in mechanization and automation in the past and where we stand right now and, and what is necessary uh, or what, what's the direction for future. Agricultural mechanization was recognized as one of the most important engineering achievements of 20th century. I think it was um, placed at number six or number eight among 100 different uh, achievements recognized uh, for 20th century. That's because we developed these kinds of really powerful, uh, robust, and um, impactful technologies that uh, could uh, till and plant and, and harvest thousands and thousands of acres of different kinds of crops, such as corn and soybean and wheat, and, and just uh, with a couple of people working with these machines. Compared to, uh, for example, uh, almost 100 years ago in the United States, there, were, uh, there was about 90% of the population involved in farming. Uh, we right now stand around 1% or so uh, of the population involved in farming. That's the kind of revolution we made with these kinds of machines. And that's why it was recognized as one of the um, most important ac accomplishments of the 20th century. It's not just uh, because there are big machines re reducing the use of labor, but also uh, these machines help us produce um, uh, as much and uh, farm as widely as possible and also uh, be more precise and, and um, more uh, uh, or lead to better yield and quality uh, with these machines. And that's why uh, it's really important. Um, here is another example of uh, a number of planters working in these kinds of fields, um, boom sprayers, um, applying different kinds of uh, farm uh, inputs, farming inputs, harvesters like this, uh, what do you call company harvesters, they're harvesting corn and soybean. Uh, harvester like this. And in addition to those mechanisms and technologies, we also recently have been developing and, and adopting various kinds of automate, automated and autonomous uh, to some extent autonomous tools in farming. One of the examples include auto guidance and auto steering systems. Uh, more than 70% of the tractors produced in the world these days, um, based on some of the statistics I have seen recently, are equipped with uh, GPS guided auto steering uh, systems uh, that can allow uh, driving these tractors uh, in predefined paths within a couple of centimeters of accuracy, uh, planting and harvesting or applying chemicals or whatever else that needs to happen in the field. And um, again, that um, allows operators to be um, uh, involved in various other uh, activities, such as making sure the, the grain being harvested is actually unloaded onto a grain cart uh, without any wastes uh, or spillover. Um, certainly it reduces the fatigue and the stress level, um, both uh, emotional, mental, and physical, all with that kind of long and, and, and tedious uh, steering operation uh, if this kind of technology would not be available. So that's one example. However, we still are benefiting from this kind of technologies in certain crops, such as um, the ones I mentioned, uh, particularly those row crops, such as corn and soybean and wheat. There are many other crops, such as apples, in this case, that um, where we still use a lot of human labor to perform almost everything that happens in the field, such as training trees, pruning trees, pollinating to some extent. Um, applying different kinds of inputs and harvesting to be, um, uh, I mean, the harvesting being one of the most uh, labor intensive operations. These two are the pictures I started the presentation with. Uh, one on our left uh, was taken some 80 years ago and one on our right is, is just a couple of years ago. And other than the color or that lack of in one of those, uh, the way we've been harvesting apples have not evolved a whole lot. Uh, you, we can see, um, these workers are using ladders and, and uh, they're using bags and they're climbing up and down these ladders with uh, 20, 30, sometimes 40 pounds of fruit. Um, really difficult, um, um, physically challenging, and sometimes also a risky or dangerous job because there have been a lot of ladder fall related um, accidents and injuries and sometimes even death associated with these kinds of operations. And that's why 
I think uh, with all the AI and robotic and all the technologies we've been um, developing and, and have access to right now with really powerful computational infrastructure, I think we, we now have uh, the ability and, and I, think, I think also, I think we are um, as, as a human being, I think I have this responsibility to develop robotic automated machines that would do some of these really difficult challenging of um, by these machines uh, while uh, creating new jobs uh, in manufacturing, supervising, operating, and maintaining these machines uh, for uh, people involved in farming. So with that, um, I think I already mentioned why it is important, um, as you can see in these uh, pictures here. Uh, with that, I just want to kind of repeat that uh, there have been a lot of uh, research and development in this area over the last three, four, five decades. Uh, however, we have only um, been able to have a limited commercial success so far. Um, there are a couple of machines that have been that have been commercially available for thinning and weeding. Uh, there are some uh, precision and automated chemical application systems, but I think our our success is still uh, rather limited, and I think we still have a lot of efforts to put in research and development in this area so that we have robust, reliable, and widely acceptable machines and that, that can be commercially uh, adopted uh, within the, again, uh, economic um, uh, situation farmers go through. Um, as, as we all know, as also Dr. Singh mentioned, uh, who operate in really thin margins. Uh, in recent years, uh, to address some of the challenges that we're facing in uh, automation robotics and then it's, uh, it's adoption in farming, um, universities, some of them listed here and others in, in Asia and, and Australia and Europe and America and in some other and, and Africa and South, South America and pretty much everywhere are focusing on uh, addressing challenges around speed and accuracy and cost and, and various other limitations. Uh, here is another example from Europe. Um, I think this was a project um, that uh, they carried out um, until uh, about two years ago or so. And um, in, in New Zealand, there is this company called Robotics Plus, uh, heavily involved in developing robotic solutions for kiwi fruit harvesting and apple harvesting. Uh, there is this company down in Florida called Harvest Crew, I was in their uh, manufacturing facility, research and development facility, uh, just, just a couple of months ago. This progress in, in developing and potentially uh, providing a commercial solution for strawberry farmers in terms of picking. Um, there is this company called FF Robotics. I'll talk a little bit more about this company later on as well, because I work with them really closely in developing a commercial solution for apple harvesting. This is one of the uh, two companies that were uh, heavily involved uh, in developing robotic machines for apple harvesting until recently. Uh, this is another one, uh, Abandoned Robotics, one of the two that I mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, this company stopped working in this area uh, just a couple of months ago, um, but uh, there is an effort in reviving the company through uh, some new um, funding model as if I have heard uh, and seen in the um, literature and the news outlets. However, with all those um, recent efforts, we still lack the desired speed, accuracy, and robustness in developing robotic solutions for various kinds of farming operations, such as picking apples, uh, produce plant and uh, uh, produce or plant damage is another issue, and cost and lack of adoption, as I mentioned earlier. Agriculture runs in really thin margins and, and producing machines that would be uh, commercially viable, economically viable for these um, farming operations is, is a real challenge. It's, uh, I mean, robotics, um, robotic technologies and, 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 and um, uh, efforts in developing various kinds of robots have been out there for a long time. And a lot of uh, robots are making ways into and have been in, uh, in operation in uh, industrial settings such as manufacturing and uh, also space and, and um, defense industries, where often 
uh, cost is not as big of a factor as in agriculture. But in agriculture, again, we need to have uh, robotic machines that are fast and accurate and can operate in outdoor environment under sun and the rain and under various other environmental conditions, but also are really uh, affordable for growers. And that's the challenge that we're facing. To address some of the challenges, um, my research program at Washington State University have been, uh, has been focusing on various and different kinds of uh, robotic projects. Um, certainly it, it involves machine vision, different kinds of sensing and other components that go with the robotic systems. But in the next couple of slides, I'll mostly focus on giving you uh, a few examples from uh, the uh, examples of the robotic prototypes that we've been developing for uh, different kinds of farming operations. One of the areas I have been working really closely uh, is robotic ap apple picking. I'll let the video play for about 30 seconds here. Yeah, continue, please. <laughs> So as you can see on our left here is the prototype, a couple of versions of those actually uh, developed in my lab over the last five, six years, maybe seven. Um, if I, I mean, from the starting point and then over years, we um, made uh, various kinds of improvements. And then uh, starting 2018, 2019 timeframe, we started working with this company called FF Robotics out of Israel and developing a, a commercial, or fully scale machine rather that uh, with, a, with a goal to commercialize it as soon as possible. Uh, this machine currently running on our right is the one developed uh, in collaboration with Hepis Robotics. Uh, they built all the all mechanical and, and all the components and then this big machine was built here um, uh, in Washington, being tested in Washington farms and Israeli farms um, over the last couple of years and making really uh, promising are, are, are showing real good promise for commercial adoption in recent future. Another um, concept in apple harvesting is what we call multi-layer uh, targeted second cat system. This is an alternative approach I have been researching. And as you can see from this quick video, um, yeah, yeah. Will... As you saw in this video, this machine will um, get into the field uh, with multiple layers of sakers and catchers and would uh, be used to uh, locate a small section of the trees uh, where we grab a little branch or um, a, uh, a section of the tree and apply only right amount of uh, saking energy so that uh, fruit from the local region would be detached from the branches and would be captured right on right underneath where they are uh, so that we can minimize the distance traveled by this fruit and and thus um, reducing the total impact force when these fruit are caught by the catching mechanism the catching mechanism would also have a foam and other foam or other kinds of material that would reduce the uh, amount of uh, impact on this fruit so that we could keep the quality um, at a level that would be acceptable for, um, for commercial uh, fresh market consumption. Now that said, certainly um, uh, this machine is still damaging fruit uh, a little bit more than human pickers would. Uh, for example, for some varieties, we're getting the, the, the fruit damage rate down to about 10%, whereas um, commercial crew would uh, lead to about 5% of fruit damage. So at the end, certainly it comes down to economic uh, viability as well. If the machine uh, with 5% uh, additional damage um, would uh, harvest the fruit at a rate that would be comparable with human labor, 
then it makes sense for adapting these kinds of technologies. We are continuing to improve this and, and make it uh, more uh, robust and, and uh, more applicable to different kinds of varieties and, and cropping systems. Um, but again, this is kind of a complementary and uh, alternative approach to robotic picking that we saw in the previous slide. Um, just to summarize again, um, in the robotic picking uh, approach, uh, we've seen what we saw is that we are going to get one foot at a time. There are um, uh, robotic hands uh, grabbing them and, and putting onto a conveyor belt. Um, those kinds of technologies are necessary for some of the varieties that are really fragile and, and are susceptible to bruising and cuts and punctures. Uh, and there are other varieties which are not as expensive and, and uh, it may not uh, be um, affordable for us to use robotic machines, uh, but uh, this kind of uh, mass harvesting system would make a lot of sense for those, uh, particularly when the, the variety is relatively tougher and can take more damages, uh, more impact before they are damaged. So that's about how to think. I also have been working in developing various kinds of robotic solutions for uh, canopy and crop load management. Uh, one example here is for pruning. As we can see, we're testing a robotic system for uh, finding where branches are and cutting desired branches from trees. And this is the pruning process uh, is being tested in the lab right now. And we're trying to take it to the field actually this week. Um, uh, this work, work is being uh, conducted in collaboration with researchers from various other universities that I've listed here, Carnegie Mellon, Oregon State University, um, and uh, Pennsylvania State University as well. Uh, we're not only working on robots for pruning, uh, but also um, trying to develop robots for pollination, a robot for thinning flowers, a robot for thinning um, green fruit and such. Um, we're also working on uh, strawberry harvesting uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, researchers from University of Central Florida and, uh, and University of uh, California at Merced. Uh, we're trying to develop a small uh, ro uh, modular robots that would collaborate among each other and um, perform a really uh, robust harvesting operation in the field. And this is a different philosophy than the a uh, big uh, robotic machine, some of the private companies such as Harvest Crew are trying to develop. Um, we are here we focus on a small uh, modular system so that uh, small farmers would be able to, to purchase and use just a couple of them. Whereas large farmers with uh, wide um, production areas would be able to uh, purchase many of those and use them in collaborative ways uh, for optimal harvesting. We have been also working with uh, uh, unmanned aerial systems or drones, uh, but uh, in my research program, mostly our focus has been in using this, these um, aerial robots for performing certain active operations in the fields, uh, including deterrence uh, of uh, birds that feed in different kinds of crops. Um, and as we can see here in this example, uh, when we're flying uh, these, uh, aerial robots, uh, the number of birds feeding in crops have been uh, reduced really substantially um, from several, like 700 in one of these examples here to a um, couple of hundreds. Now with those examples behind, I would like to spend just a few minutes talking about uh, some of the future directions that I believe uh, we're going into uh, to make these kinds of systems more robust, reliable, and practically adaptable. Um, to lay out a quick foundation here in terms of our uh, future direction, we've been talking about and developing and utilizing mechanization solutions such as harvesters and planters and, and all the machines we saw in, uh, in my presentation earlier. Uh, we're also adding automation and robotics into the uh, solution, uh, set of solutions, such as the auto guidance, auto steering system I mentioned earlier, uh, robotic weeding machines, and, and various other kinds of uh, automated robotic machines that we have been developing. 
Uh, these machines interact together to achieve what we call precision management or, or precision agriculture, where again, the goal is to apply right amount of uh, input at right time at right location. And um, these three pieces work uh, and go hand in hand because uh, we need uh, various kinds of uh, decision support tools that can help uh, to make uh, decisions for precision management. But to implement it, we need mechanization solutions that can carry input, for example, or can perform field operations and are automated so that we can only apply um, right amount of input at right time at right location. And that's the kind of the entire uh, ecosystem here. And this uh, integration of all pieces together uh, with uh, AI empowered tools and techniques uh, is what we call smart or intelligent agriculture. We also sometimes call it agriculture 4.0 in parallel to industry 4.0, we might have heard around. So with um, this kind of concept moving forward, I think um, we have a few challenges and opportunities uh, to, to be better and to be again, able to adopt these kinds of smart farming solutions uh, for our future of farming. Um, one of the challenging area uh, for automation and robotics in, in these kinds of crops is achieving high efficiency um, as we operate in the field. For example, with uh, the latest technology we have developed and in the most modern apple orchards, our picking efficiency is still around 65% to 70, sometimes up to 80% but it's still we're not able to get to 90 or 100 percent of picking uh, with these robots um, in conventional orchards it's even worse and not really realistic um, yet in terms of application of these kinds of robotic solutions for picking apples and other kinds of fruit crops uh, in those conventional orchards the speed complexity and cost is still remains to be a challenge um, but we are looking into technologies such as soft robotics where uh, robotic uh, machines could be uh, much uh, cheaper compared to uh, rigid manipulators and that we have been using now. Uh, we're also developing multi-purpose machines so that uh, a robot would not only be able to pick apples, but it would be used year round to perform all kinds of field operations such as pruning and thinning and pollination so that our big investment in these kinds of relatively complex and expensive machines would make much more sense compared to just using it for one operation that happens just a couple of months within a year. In addition, we are certainly also looking at and interested in human machine collaboration. As I mentioned earlier, robots are only so good and can do only so much. Um, there are a lot of other areas where uh, human is still have to be involved and, and collaboration between human and robot and human and uh, uh, machine in AI tools and techniques and expert systems is really uh, critical. And we're working on these kinds of uh, human in the loop uh, technologies to develop the integrated systems level solution that makes economic sense um, and uh, provide robust solutions for farmers. In addition, uh, we are working on teams uh, with experts from various disciplines, such as uh, biological sciences and economic, socioeconomic sciences, in addition to uh, physical sciences, because I think these kinds of collaborations are essential uh, to be able to develop the type of solutions we would like to develop um, uh, for this kind of uh, challenging uh, field operations. The two more slides here, I, I believe this should be the, the second last uh, in this slide. Uh, what I wanted to kind of uh, um, lay a, kind of lay out a, a, a concept of uh, developing modular and low cost solutions for farming. Um, I think some of the drone technologies have already uh, a potential to be applicable in various kinds of farms all over the world, not just in the large scale industrial farming in the US, um, but also um, the robotic solutions that we're looking at with um, modular concept, uh, small robots, uh, relatively uh, low cost sensors and um, reliable, but low cost uh, software tools and 
and such would be uh, the direction. Again, small farmers could adopt just one or two of those and large farmers could um, acquire many of those. And that's the direction I think would be helpful for uh, supporting both the small and large scale operations. Certainly, as we all know, um, cell phone based applications or mobile applications would be another direction where we can make um, more impact uh, to growers from all scale, all size, all location, all demographics, um, because these are tools accessible to uh, farmers around the world and we could develop software solutions that could run in these um, relatively powerful uh, and increasingly powerful uh, computational tools available to farmers these days around the world. Uh, one example here we can see is Apple counting, um, but these kinds of solutions are being developed for um, disease detection, um, various other kinds of applications for farmers that could be again uh, widely available uh, at a relatively low cost. With that, uh, finally, I'd like to um, emphasize that to make all of these kinds of uh, integrated solutions um, meaningful and applicable in farming operations, um, connectivity is, is a big uh, challenge. Uh, I go five miles outside, outside of my uh, research station and the signal is already really weak and sometimes cannot even call um, forget about the, um, the uploading of um, 15 megapixel or 20 megapixel uh, images that we capture with various kinds of sensors. So this is a big limitation, but I think uh, globally, uh, both private and uh, public institutions are looking into solutions and hopefully uh, in, will improve in, in recent future. I uh, would li also like to mention briefly that uh, we'd like to go into plant level management. I already talked about it a little in the, um, when I began my presentation, but each plant is different and we'd like to optimize uh, our input to those um, based on their needs. And finally, as many of these automated robotic machines make their ways into farming, I think we can go into this concept of agricultural control center human uh, cyber physical system concept where uh, operators, supervisors, um, and uh, people involved in farming would be uh, primarily um, overseeing the operation from distance. It could be offices or even a, a tractor or truck um, that is uh, parked outside of the farm. And again, I think this will allow to for the farming more uh, safer and um, and easier for workers, and again, um, provide more job opportunities that are better paid and um, year round compared to uh, difficult seasonal jobs in the fans. With that, thank you very much, guys. I'm not sure if I took more than what I supposed to, um, but if, it, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer those. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. Uh, we are here to hear and uh, see uh, the most of the new developments uh, as you have already presented in last year. And uh, this is a, a good opportunity for us to think on the, some of the issues like pollination and uh, the hybrid drone robotic uh, machine de design. 
and it will be very much privilege for all of our uh, pg phd students to think about the new research area uh, in this regard uh, i open up the discussion and uh, if any anyone is having any difficulty uh, can start discuss discussion yes student side any question from student yes okay i have one submission regarding this uh as the speed response for harvesting the fruits and machine vision system for for detecting the uh, the correct fruit with the percent of maturity uh, how we can go for the modeling thanks if you are talking about uh, the modeling effort behind machine vision system for detecting fruit and its accuracy. Um, I can go into a little bit of details there. Um, when I began, certainly deep learning didn't exist. I mean, it existed, but it was not the type of technology that was um, widely used, particularly because we didn't have the computational infrastructure to do deep learning. So we began with, um, using regular color cameras and control lighting environment by creating um, over the row uh, covering or tunnel structure that would create a more uniform environment. And then we'd do various kinds of uh, image processing techniques to, to look at color, texture, size, and shape. And then we would use those um, features um, in uh, uh, unsupervised or supervised classification techniques such as support vector machine or new, classical neural network or Bayesian classifier and be able to detect. Uh, we're also using circular half transform and some, some other segmentation techniques and we'll be able to detect uh, more like 90% or so of apples with those techniques, um, particularly when the apples were uh, of red variety because there are some, uh, some varieties with uh, green apples and it's relatively more challenging. And now with the different, different types of deep learning models that we have been testing in the last four or five years, um, the robustness of uh, machine vision system has, has gone up. In terms of accuracy, it's still around 90, 95%, depending upon the canopy, because some fruits are behind and or blocked by other fruit and it's, it's relatively challenging there. Uh, but um, deep learning technologies, um, whether you use regular mask RCNN or go to YOLO V4, now YOLO V5, um, these technologies are providing, again, quite accurate results, but also they're a little bit more robust than uh, our conventional method of uh, segmenting out and using classification techniques, um, particularly because uh, these um, deep learning models are looking into features, I believe, that are less susceptible to changes in the uh, intensities, um, whether it is shadowing from other canopy parts or, or cloudy day or a sunny day, I mean, those kinds of variabilities were challenging during the, when we're developing uh, conventional machine vision systems, uh, deep learning models have helped there. So I think in summary, uh, we have really good um, deep learning models these days and can lead, lead to 90, 95% of uh, detection accuracy and quite robust outcome that could be applied to uh, different environmental conditions. Nice to see that the progress of robustness and the machine vision system, which is uh, generating a, a very strong logic for the detection of the exact maturity 
and uh, hope so because we are also interested to join such a kind of uh, data extraction uh, for which our uh, PG PhD student and faculty are uh, interested to join. So can you just uh, have a guide guidance for the students uh, in which area they should start working? Um, certainly a little bit of mathematics and a little bit of email processing. Um, these tools and background would be really helpful and a, and a good program, uh, kind of good, good grasp on a programming language, whether that be Python or even MATLAB or C++ or, or whatever else um, uh, is there. And once you have those three pieces, a little bit of mathematics, a little bit of concept in around image processing and, and one programming language, um, I think you're ready. Um, if you are really new into um, machine vision systems, um, there are uh, certainly uh, online lectures from MIT or other places, but also you can just grab a little um, textbook or if you have any um, classes available at postgraduate or undergraduate level, um, certainly can start there. Um, we also sometimes provide uh, internship opportunities to um, the students. And if you guys are interested in doing a little bit of an internship where you could explore um, machine vision, automation related work that we do at WS2 uh, remotely, I'd be happy to uh, hear from you. Uh, it, again, is not for everybody and um, remote internship may not be the best experience ever, but uh, certainly provides a little bit of exposure. Um, I cannot accommodate too many, but if you guys are interested, I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, yes. So, I don't know. Uh, sir, one more question from student. Uh, just, uh, they are thinking after listening to your lecture, is the pollination is possible in dead pump using AIBS technique? Um, I know the question is around pollination, but could you repeat a little bit? It was noisy when you're talking. The pollination is uh, expected in dead farm using AI based technique. Um, so, if it's asking uh, what kind of technologies and what kind of AI solutions might be applicable in, in uh, pollination, again, due to some background noise, I couldn't hear you um, entirely. Um, pollination is one of the field operations that we're trying to uh, automate or use robots to perform. Um, as in many other field applications, uh, pollination also requires us to use machine vision system to uh, find and locate targets. And in this case, these are flowers. Uh, detecting flowers with uh, deep learning models such as mask RCNN or YOLO V5 is possible and quite accurate actually uh, in terms of uh, segmenting, cluster, segmenting out clusters. But when it comes to segmenting individual flowers within flower clusters, it's quite challenging. And, and I think if there are researchers interested in this area, faculty or uh, postdoctoral researchers or even graduate students, I think that could be a good um, kind of area that you could focus on. Um, our team is working in some of this, but again, um, finding individual flowers is still something we have not been able to uh, do a very good job. Now, once we know where flower clusters are, uh, from that point is basically using the same kind of robotic system. Instead of now sending a cotter into cutting branches, for example, we would now have a little uh, pollen a sprayer that would get closer to the flowers and spray uh, a little bit of pollen onto uh, flower surfaces. So from that perspective, certainly AI is involved in machine vision, as in AI can be involved in control. Um, in general, it's, it's still another robotic system to perform uh, another field operation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.
for deliberating your very unique topic and uh, your topic has created the some uh, imagination among the students so which are the trust area they can work in the semi arid tracks of maratra region so definitely we have the collaboration in future as a faculty for the students and our pi is always willing to have a collaboration collaborative works to extend this kind of activity in our region particularly in maharashtra so definitely we will have a future collaboration in coming days so on behalf of uh, this uh, nahe project and our as a organizing secretary i express my sincere thanks for deliberating your exhaustive lecture and uh, it was a really uh, another feast for us in morning previous lecture by dr aditya singh from florida another lecture man dr manoj karki from wc pulman really sir we are happy and uh, good night to you thank you very much sir thank you very much everybody um looking forward to your visit uh, to washington state and and certainly uh will visit you guys at some point uh, it's been certainly challenging pandemic time that has kind of limited our uh, ability to to move around uh, but i hope things will go better and we'll see see each other in person soon um certainly i'd be more than happy to repeat another lecture like this in in virtual setting whenever it is um desirable well that thank you very much guys thank you thank you sir
Hello, good morning. Yes, sir. Hope everyone is fine. Uh, sorry to disturb you again with another talk. But uh, today we'll be looking at remote sensing and GIS advanced levels. A little bit just uh, an introduction so that um, hopefully you'll get a GIS center uh, in your United project where we can have these data done at your center for each and every one. Okay. So today my topic is advanced mapping and digital technologies for agriculture, soil, and water resource management. So why these particular topics? Because mapping of, of agriculture soil and water resources have always been left behind. Okay, so there are uh, agencies within the government that monitors and maps yield, but when it comes to water and soil, it is kind of left behind. So let's look at um, the outline for today. I'll be going through some. So uh, the first uh, part I look at is mapping of water resources and crop area, why it's needed. GIS, I'll just give a small introduction, just two, three slides, because most of this you have to self-learn. Okay, so all technologies will not be given to you um, as a lesson, but the infrastructure is already given in NADA project, where you have all the desktops and software ready. So what we'll do is uh, we'll go through why it's important and so that you have an understanding. The data that goes into these GIS networks and what is smart data. Yesterday we saw some ICT IoT tools. So today we'll look at some of the data and applications to crop area mapping, surface water mapping, groundwater, and Mandrega. See, Mandrega is a scheme that has helped a lot of villagers, uh, but it's not helping the science of conservation of water and soil. It's one-sided, okay? So why cannot you use the villagers' benefit, the 100 rupees scheme or the 100 day scheme, and also use them for soil and water management? This is also in line of yesterday, my part of talk, which is uh, AC, ICT and IMT tools for agriculture, 4.0. Let's look at the agriculture sector. It is one of the most important sectors in India, consumes about 84% of the total water. Okay, so uh, we are an agrarian nation and you are the best universities that are working for agriculture and uh, farmers. But what is missed is that 84% of water is not anywhere kind of contained or conserved. The contribution to GDP is only 16.5%, even though 84% of water is used. The employment force is high. This includes direct and indirect indirect people of 55% of the workforce. Why do we need better water, uh, water and crop data? So I'll just show through the need statement. All the agricultural policies, so we are not only talking about data, but policy for farmers, policy for agriculture. The biggest budgets are allocated to agriculture. So please understand that when I say farming agriculture policies, for example, there's subsidies for fertilizer, there's subsidies for soil, Mandrega is a policy, right? So you can have all these schemes and policies later. 
okay and all the budgetary allocations you need to understand how much water and crop is available the fourth point is um, after the economical survey crop insurance is very very important you have a drought you have a flood you have pest uh, you know attacking your crops you need some crop insurance and for the crop insurance uh, you need to have better data on crop and water availability and again the normal procedures of land use classification water budgeting etc you need better data okay the last is your market linkage if only if you know how much uh, crop is growing how much water is available you can link it to the market and have a price so let's look at how the government of india does it how many of you have seen this um, in your classes i don't know because i have not taught this only when you do the research you find these kind of statistics and the lag in the statistics okay for example the agricultural statistics is a big book uh, which is given at 2020 but published in only 2021 so what is the issue the fao says uh, some countries lack ability to compile the new set of data uh, and the government of india publication agri data was published in 2021 so already there is a one year lag okay so it's not like they're waiting for december and then january this report comes up it almost takes 12 months for the report to come up so what happens is one year the uh, policy the book doesn't help the farmers to be prepared the same thing happens next year also okay so uh, and what data is inside that is the tricky part it was uh, published in 2021 okay it says uh, they are at a glance at 2020 but the actual data was 2018 inside the book so there's already one to two years lag in the data that can be used for your uh, farming and why they call it 2020 because an estimate an estimate of how much need how much water consumption can happen there's already delay of two years in publishing data data is based on sample survey not actual data so when you involve farmers what you do you give advisories but there's no data coming back from the farmer to this so that is why you have to build a two-way system to collect data from farmers. So that was the central government. Let's look at uh, Maharashtra government where we are. Uh, it's also the same. We have the economic survey of Maharashtra 2021. Um, and then the data used in the book is 2018-19. And an estimate was given for 2020. So same two years lag. Data is based on sample survey. Okay, whenever you have a drought or a flood, they will take a sample, not the entire area for assessing damage. And that is where there is a delay. So that was the agriculture, and in the NWRD, which is the water resource department, also in Marathi, will have the same <laughs> issues of lag. Okay, so 2000 published, uh, 2020 published, data is 2019, two years of uh, lag, and the data is collected by department staff without any sample procedures. There's no big procedures that are put in. All these books are online. You can download them for free. Please uh, go through it and then understand that there is a lag. Okay, so why is this data important? Okay, why do we need this area and crop water data important? It is important for the government and uh, national agencies to design policy, farmers to have land record, and then uh, subsidy, compensation, uh, insurance, etc. Okay, the suppliers need to know where the product is coming from, and the banks like uh, HFC and other banks they need to know how much area is there. Sorry, I think it is not visible, but uh, the conditions are off. Um, agriculture retailers they need to know what is the yield. Agro based industries like the uh, crop industries, uh, tractors, etc., they need to know the production storage unit, and the international NGOs and organizations. They need to export this data to the World Bank and other banks for better management uh, policies. Okay, so this is where I've established a criteria. Water is important, soil is important, but the data that the government is giving has a lag. So you can use GIS and advanced remote sensing methods for getting the data. So what is GIS? I think uh, last year when I came, I had a five-day workshop. But today, what I'll give you is just an introduction so that you can go back and uh, refresh it. So GIS is an information system, uh, but mostly based on geography. Okay, it has a location. The data will have a location from where an information can be attached. Okay. Do I have permit or? 
Okay, so most importantly, it is a software that where you can collect data which has zero geographic information uh, and you can analyze. Okay, so these two are together, which is the beauty. It is a software not only like an Excel which has data, it is a software which can also used to be uh, analyzing and mapping the data on spatial platform. Okay, it also allows you to overlay data sets. What do you mean by overlay is when you buy a cake, sometimes you have only one layer. Okay, and now you have a 3D layer uh, cake uh, in your workshop, but see how many layers you want to put. And that layering is done by GIS with different data. Here it is not a cake, but it is different layers of data, and you see what is a uh, benefit. I'll show you an example. Okay, so basically you have an Excel sheet which is having your data, and you have a location which is a map. You're now trying to triangulate both into one data. So what is GIS is nothing but having, like for example, three is this parcel of land on this on the ground, and three is this row number uh, which is as a data. Okay, so this data is now associated with this parcel because of GIS. So this is what I said. You can layer it for producing a land use land cover of a region. You have land use map, you have a street map, district map, parcel. Parcel is land parcel. So you take each data, pile it one on top of each other, and then you can make a composite image of what is happening. Okay. So these are smart maps because it's linking a database to the map. Okay. And you can also use this map method to analyze and pick data which you want. So there's multiple data that is available for free. And for pay, for example, you have the aerial inventory of drones, uh, bird view, um, all those <coughs> etc. data, world wind, geo AI, all these are commercial data sets, but you also have a lot of open source data, ISRO, NASA, uh, and Sentinel, etc. All of this has to come to a platform, and then you can work on producing the maps. And what we produced last time is, or what we taught is open source GIS, that is QGIS. There are multiple softwares, but again, GIS is just to understand for you. It has data coming in images or Excel sheets. You club them together on a GIS platform and make beautiful maps. From the maps, you can make the data for water and land use records. Okay, so you can digitize different maps. You can bring in multiple digital products to collect data, make a geographic database, and then the map can be made. So databases can be tables of data. It can be printed and scanned maps like your topography maps. Okay, it can be your personal map. For example, when I was coming in Aurangabad, uh, I was taking pictures from the phone on farm fonts. Okay, so now I can go back and then make it a GIS layer because I know exactly where I took the image right in the airport, right? So that X Y location is given, and I know where the farm fonts are. So all this data you can create. You don't have to wait for others and give you data, and just you need the location. The other is field sampling, because you are all very active in field, a lot of sampling you take. You can use that into your GIS, and most importantly, you can use your remote sensing data with satellites, drones, etc. in your GIS. <coughs> Apart from this, there is a lot of data available. I'll just show you some of the data. Uh, this is the NASA's Earth Science Missions, and you could see, uh, you know, a string of toys because a lot of satellites are there, um, and each one has its own specific role. They don't compete against each other. For example, Grace is a satellite which does only groundwater, and then you have Landsat, which takes images of land, uh, which is your colored uh, features like your red, green, blue, your hyperspectral images, etc. Then you have your tropics, which is your rainfall, and then you have Landsat, which is seven, which is the um, older version of Landsat line, and they are still in motion. You have Grace 2, Aqua, etc. So all these have a specific purpose of science and investigations. Okay, and we are not far away. I'll show you the other satellites. So this is the NASA, NASA, which is the US, and this is the European satellites. Again, a fleet of satellites. And each one has a range. So this is a meteorological uh, where you have uh, climate and other factors. And then you have your uh, land use, land cover, mapping, your imaging software from the Copernicus Sentinel missions. 
and then you have your earth exploratory missions on the periphery so you have three different layers and all different satellites that are there we are not that far okay so india is also in the space race uh, one among the six nations that are competing for top positions uh, in uh, launching and satellites so we have a whole uh, fleet of satellites which are useful for taking images like insat uh, 2e insat 3a we have the edusat just for education purposes connection communication um, and then you have your uh, resource sat here resource sat cargo sat which gives you the elevation and mapping of uh, areas okay so there is some uh, <coughs> some duplication between the nations so there is some duplication between the nations which should be avoided but what happens mostly is because every nation wants to show themselves as a satellite and remote sensing agency they keep these satellites you are free to use uh, whatever data you want so one side you have satellites and the other side you have the fleet of drones and you also have data sets like this which you can be using okay so this is open source so some people will collect the drone data and they will put it on a server which can be used by everyone so in the remote sensing you have three different types one is your low in situ subsurface where you have um, like your phone mobile phone aided uh, remote sensing data for small satellites uh, and then you have uh, drones uh, which is medium aerial non satellite and then you have your high satellite which is high in the elevation so by elevation and also how you connect to the system you can just club them into different zones of remote sensing so the idea is there is multiple multiple uh, platforms for data so please don't say i don't have data just how to get the data is uh, interesting okay so you have to learn how it so for example per day covering 1.4 million 29 megapixel images per day covering more than 300 million kilometers square okay so over 6 terabytes of data are sent back to earth every day 6 terabytes so every day you have the image of the earth you have all the uh, data available for droughts monitoring etc on top of this these kind of apps like planetix and other data can also help in building a data for managing water managing soil etc okay so this is another important part on a fire line all you see on the left hand side is the different data sets okay so you have your satellites you have your acquiring systems recording systems and then your archiving this is all hardware and software which uh, is not needed for now to deeply understand but to understand what data i have for water resources ground water etc then there is some pre processing and value addition okay so these two steps are also done by the satellite agencies for example nasa german companies they would involve in the pre processing and value addition and give you that information which is is there rainfall or not is there ground water or not this kind of data is given in the last part and then you do the long thematic uh, range trends all these things you can do using your gis software so you should be concentrating as students here where there's a lot of applications you can make and this part what data is being collected this is just an information you should have a table of remote sensing data and every month or year you just update them because satellites are launched frequently but here is where you build a capacity for mapping <coughs> and nowadays you have a lot of free data available and easily quickly downloadable using earth engine data products okay again a lot of data uh, more than 5 petabytes of data in google earth engine i'll show you uh, how it is done and then we have a fossi tutorials fossi i think everyone knows here because most of the tutorials are already used for r and python Uh, so there are also tutorials for downloading these data in 17 languages okay so what is google earth engine uh, it is an advanced platform with a lot of data sets you can see view all data sets it's hosted by google and it has a different different layers based on your requirements okay so i will show you lively how this is done it's big data and do you need a super computer to access this data no you don't but what about this data i said 5 petabytes of data or i said uh, you know more than 
six terabytes per day. How do you process it on your computer? Your computer does not have that power bandwidth. So what do these people use? Anyone? Sorry? Super computers. <laughs> Someone was saying super and then they stop. Yes, super computers are used, which are massive. And you cannot have that readily in every college or university. For example, um, IIT Bombay has a supercomputer. Uh, it is around 70 crores, but uh, not much used. Okay, so you have all these there, but because all, the, all these are done by Google and other people, you don't have to do it. Anyway, so it, it is big data by default. However, you don't need a supercomputer, but just Google Earth Engine would suffice. What it does is it has its own storage, it has all the data stored. And there is an AI platform which can talk to your Google Earth engine. So when you give a command in Google Earth engine, it will run it from the database, run the models, and give you the output. All within five minutes, two minutes, depending on your area. I can show you a live um, um, demo now, if the internet allows. Can you see my screen? Yes. Good. So all, you, all I did is, Type Google. Oops. Earth Engine, okay. Not a company, but just type Google Earth Engine is fine. Okay, you have a type of wrong spelling. So here, Google Earth Engine will come. Just click on the first one. All you would need is a uh, sign up link. Okay, can you move the top? Can you move that side? Yeah. So you see, there's a sign up. Uh, nowadays, you don't get memberships for it that easily, uh, but you can use this using your Google account. Your Gmail account is enough. So what I'm going to do is, for example, can I take, uh, uh, what data do you need? Can I take an example of agriculture data? What do you need? Water, rainfall, sorry? Soil moisture. Soil moisture. Let me see if I, I don't know, I have it, but let's see if it has. Okay, so it says view all database, or you can search here. It has it. It has a different link, but this is more into programming. I'll show you how it's done. I click view all data sets. You can come here, filter data sets, soil, moisture. Okay. So you have you a NASA USDA enhanced S map. Uh, this is a global coverage. It says global soil moisture, and you can read it here. What it means? Ten kilometer spatial resolution. Can you see it? Ten kilometer. So all I have to do is click this data set. It opens like this. See, I'm not signed in. I did not sign in. You don't have to sign in now. Even when you run it, you don't have to sign in. Only when you uh, have to do some other metrics, you have to sign in. So what it tells you is it has data from seven years to 2015 to 2022. And these are the data partners, which is NASA. And you have the Earth Engine snippet, which is your code. People code it. OK, I'll come to that later. And if you go to bands, it will tell you what are the names of the band and the unit. So soil moisture is given at millimeters. Okay, and it is so surface soil moisture. And then there is a subsurface soil moisture, which is a little bit more deeper. Okay, and this is a millimeters. So you do have the soil moisture. I'm just going to open the code. Oops. I need a Google account on this computer. Let me sign in myself. So it has to give me a password, I think. Can I have uh, someone log in? Oh, yeah, here it is. This is me. Yeah, it worked, it worked. Okay, so tap the number shown on it. 46. Oh, sorry, sorry. This is the first time I had to do this. 
Very secret. It's not coming yet. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> so what has happened is it opens in a Google editor. Okay. So it goes to my account and then I open the Google it again, sign up. <laughs> okay, if it doesn't work, then I'll use my laptop. Okay, it's coming. So I have to sign up. Okay, let me use a different one. It's okay. So, you have a Google editor? Yeah, Google engine. Huh? Search engine. No, no, it's okay. I'll just use my other account. Sure. <laughs> okay. Did the password correct? I don't know what's happening. Sign into Zoom. No, 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 Zoom. They're here. No? They're here. Okay, I'll do one thing. I'll come back to the Google um, Earth Engine later, but let me run through the other part. Okay. So, what do I do uh, in terms of closing the water budget? So, what do you mean by water budget? You have to look at how much water is coming in through rainfall, dam, etc. And then you have to look at the ET soil moisture which is stored in the water, uh, in soil, water and soil. And then you look at groundwater. So this is what I do and this is where my satellites are, uh, I take the satellite data, okay? The GLDAS has all the satellite data necessary for, necessary for your water budget. Then you have your Bhuvan GIS, but most importantly, I will focus on the revolving globe, which is GRACE. Why is the globe like that? I'll come to you um, in a minute to just show you what. Let's look at the globe. You want to share the screen? So, yes, yes, press the button. Don't be fine. We can wait for two minutes. What is the great thing? It's not a problem. 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 So, one is called Tom and the other is called Jerry. Similar to the cartoon, Tom runs and Jerry catches. Okay, so when this is running, it has a forward speed which is pulled by the mass. Why is it pulled? Because gravity is acting on this body and it pulls. This guy is only being linked uh, to decide through how much fast is Tom going. Okay, if Tom goes fast, this accelerates. If Tom goes slow, it also goes slow. Okay, so first gravitational pull is on the first satellite, it moves faster. And then by the time it moves faster, this one talks to the, is also pulled by gravity, but most importantly, it is linked to the Tom. Okay. And this difference in acceleration actually can be accounted for the mass. Okay. So because here, when it's affected by this mass, it's gravity. And that is what you saw here. So this is this kind of your gravitational. Um, field of the earth and all it says is it's not the same. The earth is not a smooth platform. The mass is up and down and based on that okay. so 
<laughs> okay, I hope you could see my screen. Hope I'm not double audio. Okay, so <clears throat> someone asked me a data set to be data set. I go, but yeah, I just do this before we go to the grace. And then I go into search database, view all database, or I can go here. And then I type soil moisture, right? Okay, so I type soil, soil moisture. And then I got this product, the first product, right? And all I did is look at what are the different labels. You have subsurface soil, you have a surface soil. Right. And then you go to this code editor and this pulls out the code. So when you pull out the code, already my account is there. So you will have my account logged in. And Okay, so you have to just give it a second, it auto populates. So the, the code is already there. It's kind of a Python code which actually talks to the supercomputer, retrieves the data, and does the function for you. So, what is the function it is doing? It is taking the data set, which is NASA S map 10 kilometers, and then making a map. See, I'm going to run. So, when I click run, it comes out and zooms back in search with soil moisture. This is a soil map for the entire planet. I didn't do any problem. Okay. Yes. 
Okay. So what you do is you use Google Earth Engine. I've shown you the tutorials. I'll give you a YouTube tutorial how to collect data, how to read code, and adjust the numbers. Okay. Uh, to finalize, this is the last part I'll be teaching for today, where you have two satellites, as I said, and both of them talk to you. To each other, but they're controlled by the planet, and the planet is not a smooth surface. So, by understanding the distances in the mass, if you subtract it, the net mass is your groundwater change. Okay, because only groundwater changes every month, or, or terrestrial water, water stored on the on the surface, or water stored on the ground. So, what you see here is a blue color means there's more water between the months. A red color means this is water losing areas. For example, in India, you will see a very neat color that <coughs> along the Himalayan regions, you have water actually uh, depleting. Whereas in the Ganges region, it's okay and your uh, north and south are getting really hit. Okay, for that particular month. You can get data like this in grids uh, or also concentration blocks we call mass cons. Okay. So the last part I have two more minutes. Okay, so the last part I would like to touch upon is real time applications, please go to this observatory and have a look. Uh, but more importantly, you will be able to see how there is an image before the floods and after the floods. And this data came from NASA for 2018 floods. Even though we have ISRO data, we have other data sets, it takes time for processing, whereas these can be done quickly. And this done, this was done by the MIT guys uh, for helping the Kerala government. I have one of my students um, a link here. I'm just going to click it. How he has done for Marathwada region on sugarcane cultivation and just using imagery. You use imagery, you run some analysis to find the crop area and crop yield. Okay. I hope it's not, it's not visible. Stop share. Okay. So I'm putting the link also in the slide. So what you see here is just a base map and it's getting populated with the crop area. On your left, you see 2016-17, okay? On the right, I'm going to pick 2017-18 yield map. Because the internet is a little bit uh, slow, you'll get that slow populating. But what you see is two different areas of crop, crop yield. Why, why is this helpful? For example, I have a drought here in 2017-18. I can compare which areas were hit uh, by the drought. I'm going to show you like this. See, I just have a slider. And when I move the slider, it actually would update automatically. The internet is slow. So let me just double click. Why is it coming two times? I don't know. OK, so this side is 2019-20. OK, and you could see it will populate. Uh, now it's populating. OK, so you see how it is changing colors and the legends and everything is given. So one particular area, but this side is for uh, using uh, choice of choice here as 2016-17 for classification and the yield map is given for 2017-18. So you could change and see how much area is being cropped just by satellites and the resolution is 10 meters. Okay, So by 10 meters, you could actually show uh, very good data. Okay, so <coughs> I put the link here. So when I share this map, uh, please use it. So Mandrega is known for okay. So you have soil conservation, water conservation activities, uh, but there is not much you have for actually quantifying the benefits of these structures. So look at how much structure budget they've put. Okay, so if you have 671,000 crores annually given to Mandrega, okay, 60% of that is given to NRM, which is uh, natural resource management, uh, and, and particularly water. And then these other things are getting. So you're almost getting 40,000 crores every year to manage water. But what is happening to these assets? So these are the assets which is your check dams, your farm ponds, all these things. These are all assets in the Madriga. Are they actually helping the water balance? Are they actually helping the soil is a question. For which there is a need for mapping <laughs> and evaluation and impact. These are the geo portals by Madriga and Bhuvan. All they give you is the location. It does not give you the actual benefit of the scheme. Whereas your benefit can be visualized like this. So what you have is a series of check dams taken in 1991. And this is 2017, both same 
water year or rainfall year. Just look at the rainfall. Okay, so rainfall here in 1991 was 650 millimeters, whereas here it is 657 millimeters. Okay. Yeah, so these are the check dams, and this was just built in 1990s, so it's not actually impacting the area. But if you see in 20 years plus, what you see is <coughs> there is a lot, <coughs> excuse me, lot of areas turning blue and orange, which is less water severe. So these check dams are actually helping. And now Mandriga can look at it saying it's not an investment to just keep farmers, but I'm also increasing the water, increasing the soil. How did we do this? Because we had the satellites. No data is available there for the moisture, etc. So we have to use satellite products. Okay. So these are just the ideas I would like to give you in using remote sensing and other uh, tools for water resource mapping and crop area mapping. We looked at crop area is a big issue in India. If you don't know how much crop area, how are you going to release water? How are you going to uh, put Mandrega plants in there? Okay. So for this, remote sensing and GIS can be very helpful, especially advanced levels. Uh, no need of high computing facilities. Please so don't say I don't have a computer, powerful computer. Because when I studied these, I needed a computer. It, it will crash. But now Google Earth engine is there. All you need to do is just code. Very simple four-line codes. And even the codes, if you Google forums, they'll give you the codes. Okay, I don't know how to code. I just would type, I want a chart, and the chart will come up. Okay. Better spatial and temporal resolutions are available <coughs> because your government data is coming in monthly, whereas this remote sensing data are coming in weekly and bi-weekly um, applications. So with this, I'd like to thank everyone. I'll take questions. Thank you. Any questions? Any shy group? <laughs> Yeah, I can give you some tutorials online. You don't need to, uh, there's no book for it. Good question. Uh, you just have to self learn using YouTube uh, lectures. So, for example, here, if I can share my, I'll just show you an example. Okay. So, just go to Google. And then type, I want, uh, for example, you want soil moisture, soil moisture. Uh, okay. And then type here videos. And that's it. There's a tutorial. See, I didn't do much. I just typed it in Google. Okay. Make sure the spelling is okay, but it will capture it. Okay. This will first come. All this page will come. Yeah, this page will come where you have the data sets, etc. But there's a lot of people really willing to help. Okay, so just click videos on the top, and these are coming. You'd be amazed to see even the European agencies are using this software just for free because already people have done it. There's nothing you have to pay for it. Okay, so click this, it will show you how to download the data. Not this one, but after that. But now, okay, see. They'll show you how the code comes up and how you pull the data into it. Okay, so all this can be self-learned, and then you can target it just for India, your location. Actually, I had the example, but because I cannot connect to the computer, I cannot do it. So, any other question? Thanks. Thank you.
Thank you, sir, for delivering such a useful lecture. And definitely, it will be very useful to all students. So, practical utility. Um, now, uh, one announcement is there. Instead of having visit, uh, right now we will have the visit to Nayak Center in the afternoon session, 4 p.m. And uh, now, lunch break will be there. And uh, we will gather for the next session in the afternoon. In the scheduled time, 4 p.m., we will have the visit to Nayak Center. Okay, thank you. Okay, at 2 o'clock, you will have to gather here again for the next session. Sharply at 2 o'clock. There is a lunch break for a while now. We will gather at 2 p.m. for the sessions.